Sacherine Letters, Letter One of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Biographia Literaria, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Satyrane's Letters. Letter One. On Sunday morning, September sixteenth, seventeen ninety eight, the Hamburg packet set sail from Yarmouth, and I, for the first time in my life, beheld my native land retiring from me at the moment of its disappearance in all the kirks churches chapels and meeting-houses in which the greater number i hope of my countrymen were at that time assembled i will dare question whether there was one more ardent prayer offered up to heaven than that which i then preferred for my country now then said i to a gentleman who was standing near me we are out of our country not yet not yet he replied and pointed to the sea this too is a britain's country this bon mot gave a fillip to my spirits i rose and looked round on my fellow-passengers who were all on the deck we were eighteen in number vide lisette five englishmen an english lady a french gentleman and his servant an hanoverian and his servant a prussian a swede two danes and a mulatto boy a german tailor and his wife the smallest couple i ever beheld and a jew we were all on the deck but in a short time i observed marks of dismay the lady retired to the cabin in some confusion and many of the faces round me assumed a very doleful and frog-coloured appearance and within an hour the number of those on deck was lessened by one half i was giddy but not sick and the giddiness soon went away but left a feverishness and want of appetite which i attributed in great measure to the cybermephitis of the bilge-water and it was certainly not decreased by the exportations from the cabin however i was well enough to join the able-bodied passengers one of whom observed not inaptly that momus might have discovered an easier way to see a man's inside than by placing a window in his breast he needed only have taken a salt-water trip in a packet-boat i am inclined to believe that a packet is far superior to a stage-coach as a means of making men open out to each other in the latter the uniformity of posture disposes to dozing and the definitiveness of the period at which the company will separate makes each individual think more of those to whom he is going than of those with whom he is going but at sea more curiosity is excited if only on this account that the pleasant or unpleasant qualities of your companions are of great importance to you from the uncertainty how long you may be obliged to house with them besides if you are countrymen that now begins to form a distinction and a bond of brotherhood and if of different countries there are new incitements of conversation more to ask and more to communicate i found that i had interested the danes in no common degree i had crept into the boat on the deck and fallen asleep but was awakened by one of them about three o'clock in the afternoon who told me that they had been seeking me in every hole and corner and insisted that i should join their party and drink with them he talked english with such fluency as left me wholly unable to account for the singular and even ludicrous incorrectness with which he spoke it i went and found some excellent wines and a dessert of grapes with a pineapple the danes had christened me doctor theology and dressed as i was all in black with large shoes and black worsted stockings i might certainly have passed very well for a methodist missionary however i disclaimed my title what then may you be a man of fortune no a merchant no a merchant's traveller no a clerk no a philosophe perhaps it was at that time in my life in which of all possible names and characters i had the greatest disgust to that of un philosophe but i was weary of being questioned and rather than be nothing or at best only the abstract idea of a man i submitted by a bow even to the aspersion implied in the word un philosophe the dane then informed me that all in the present party were philosophers likewise certes we were not of the stoic school for we drank and talked and sung till we talked and sung all together and then we rose and danced on the deck a set of dancers which in one sense of the word at least were very intelligibly and appropriately entitled reels the passengers who lay in the cabin below in all the agonies of sea-sickness must have found our bacchanalian merriment a tune harsh and of dissonant mood from their complaint i thought so at the time and by way i suppose of supporting my newly assumed philosophical character i thought too how closely the greater number of our virtues are connected with the fear of death and how little sympathy we bestow on pain where there is no danger the two danes were brothers the one was a man with a clear white complexion white hair and white eyebrows looked silly and nothing that he uttered gave the lie to his looks the other whom by way of eminence i have called the dane had likewise white hair but was much shorter than his brother with slender limbs, and a very thin face, slightly pock fretten This man convinced me of the justice of an old remark, that many a faithful portrait in our novels and farces has been rashly censured for an outrageous caricature, or perhaps nonentity. I had retired to my station in the boat. 
he came and seated himself by my side and appeared not a little tipsy he commenced the conversation in the most magnificent style and as a sort of pioneering to his own vanity he flattered me with such grossness the parasites of the old comedy were modest in the comparison his language and accentuation were so exceedingly singular that i determined for once in my life to take notes of a conversation here it follows somewhat abridged indeed but in all other respects as accurately as my memory permitted the dane vat imagination vat language vat vast science and vat eyes vat a milk-white forehead oh my heaven vy you're a got answer you do me too much honour sir the dane oh me if you should think i is flattering you no 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 i have ten thousand a year yes ten thousand a year yes ten thousand pound a year vell and vat is dat a mere trifle i wouldn't give my sincere heart for ten times de money yes you're a got i a mere man but my dear friend think of me as a man is is i mean to ask you now my dear friend is i not very eloquent is i not speak english very fine answer most admirably believe me sir i have seldom heard even a native talk so fluently the dane squeezing my hand with great vehemence my dear friend what an affection and fidelity we have for each other but tell me do tell me is i not now and then speak some fault is i not in some wrong answer why sir perhaps it might be observed by nice critics in the english language that you occasionally use the word is instead of am in our best companies we generally say i am and not i is or eyes excuse me sir it is a mere trifle the dane oh is is am 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 yes yes i know i know answer i am thou art he is we are ye are they are the dane yes yes i know i know am 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 is the presence and is is the perfectum yes yes and are is the plusquam perfectum answer and art sir is the dane my dear friend it is the plusquam perfectum no no that is a great lie r is the plusquam perfectum and art is the plasquam plu perfectum then swinging my hand to and fro and cocking his little bright hazel eyes at me that danced with vanity and wine you see my dear friend that i too have some learning answer learning sir who dare suspect it who can listen to you for a minute who can even look at you without perceiving the extent of it the dane my dear friend then with a would-be humble look and in a tone of voice as if he was reasoning i could not talk so of prawns and imperfectum and futurum and plusquam plu perfectum and all that my dear friend without some learning answer sir a man like you cannot talk on any subject without discovering the depth of his information the dane de grammatic greek my friend ha 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 laughing and swinging my hand to and fro then with a sudden transition to great solemnity now i will tell you my dear friend there did happen about me what the whole historia of denmark record no instance about nobody else the bishop did ask me all the questions about all the religion in the latin grammar answer the grammar sir the language i presume the dane a little offended grammar is language and language is grammar answer ten thousand pardons the dane well and i was only fourteen years answer only fourteen years old the dane no more i was fourteen years old and he asked me all questions religion and philosophy and all in the latin language and i answered him all every one my dear friend all in the latin language answer a prodigy an absolute prodigy the dane no 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 he was a bishop a great superintendent answer yes a bishop the dane a bishop not a mere predicant not a prediger answer my dear sir we have misunderstood each other i said that your answering in latin at so early an age was a prodigy that is a thing that is wonderful that does not often happen the dane often there is not one instance recorded in the whole historia of denmark answer and since then sir the dane i was sent over to the west indies 
to our island, and there I had no more to do vid books. No, no, I put my genius another way, and I have made ten thousand pound a year. Is not dat genius, my dear friend? But vat is money? I think the poorest man alive my equal. Yes, my dear friend, my little fortune is pleasant to my generous heart, because I can do good. No man with so little a fortune ever did so much generosity. No person, no man person, no woman person ever denies it. But we are all God's children. Here the Hanoverian interrupted him, and the other Dane, the Swede, and the Prussian joined us, together with a young Englishman who spoke the German fluently, and interpreted to me many of the Prussian's jokes. The Prussian was a travelling merchant, turned of three score, a hale man, tall, strong, and stout, full of stories, gesticulations, and buffoonery, with the soul as well as the look of a mountebank who, while he is making you laugh, picks your pocket. Amid all his droll looks and droll gestures, there remained one look untouched by laughter, and that one look was the true face, the others were but its mask. The Hanoverian was a pale, fat, bloated young man, whose father had made a large fortune in London, as an army contractor. He seemed to emulate the manners of young Englishmen of fortune. He was a good-natured fellow, not without information or literature, but a most egregious coxcomb. He had been in the habit of attending the House of Commons, and had once spoken, as he informed me, with great applause in a debating society. For this he appeared to have qualified himself with laudable industry, for he was perfect in Walker's pronouncing dictionary, and with an accent which forcibly reminded me of the Scotchman in Roderick Random, who professed to teach the English pronunciation. He was constantly deferring to my superior judgment, whether or no I had pronounced this or that word with propriety, or the true delicacy. When he spoke, though it were only half a dozen sentences, he always rose, for which I could detect no other motive than his partiality to that elegant phrase so liberally introduced in the orations of our British legislators, while I am on my legs. The Swede, whom for reasons that will soon appear I shall distinguish by the name of nobility, was a strong-featured, scurvy-faced man, his complexion resembling in colour a red-hot poker beginning to cool. He appeared miserably dependent on the Dane, but was, however, incomparably the best informed and most rational of the party. Indeed, his manners and conversation discovered him to be both a man of the world and a gentleman. The Jew was in the hold. The French gentleman was lying on the deck so ill that I could observe nothing concerning him, except the affectionate attentions of his servant to him. The poor fellow was very sick himself, and every now and then ran to the side of the vessel, still keeping his eye on his master, but returned in a moment and seated himself again by him, now supporting his head, now wiping his forehead, and talking to him all the while in the most soothing tones. There had been a matrimonial squabble of a very ludicrous kind in the cabin, between the little German tailor and his little wife. He had secured two beds, one for himself and one for her. This had struck the little woman as a very cruel action. She insisted upon their having but one, and assured the mate in the most piteous tones that she was his lawful wife. The mate and the cabin boy decided in her favour, abused the little man for his want of tenderness with much humour, and hoisted him into the same compartment with his seasick wife. This quarrel was interesting to me, as it procured me a bed which I otherwise should not have had. In the evening, at seven o'clock, the sea rolled higher, and the Dane, by means of the greater agitation, eliminated enough of what he had been swallowing to make room for a great deal more. His favourite potation was sugar and brandy, i.e., a very little warm water with a large quantity of brandy, sugar, and nutmeg. His servant boy, a black-eyed mulatto, had a good-natured round face, exactly the colour of the skin of the walnut colonel. The Dane and I were again seated tete-a-tete -tete in the ship's boat. The conversation, which was now indeed rather an oration than a dialogue, became extravagant beyond all that I ever heard. He told me that he had made a large fortune in the island of Santa Cruz, and was now returning to Denmark to enjoy it. He expatiated on the style in which he meant to live, and the great undertakings which he proposed to himself to commence, till, the brandy aiding his vanity, and his vanity and garrulity aiding the brandy, he talked like a madman, and treated me to accompany him to Denmark. There I should see his influence with the government, and he would introduce me to the king, etc., etc. Thus he went on, dreaming aloud, and then, passing with a very lyrical transition to the subject of general politics, he declaimed, like a member of the corresponding society, about, not concerning, the rights of man, and assured me that, notwithstanding his fortune, he thought the poorest man alive his equal. All are equal, my dear friend, all are equal, we are all God's children, the poorest man hath the same rights with me. Jack, Jack, some more sugar and brandy. There is that fellow now. He is a mulatto, but he is my equal. That's right, Jack, taking the sugar and brandy. Here, you, sir, 
Shake hands with this gentleman. Shake hands with me, you dog. Dare, dare. We are all equal, my dear friend. Do I not speak like Socrates and Plato and Cato? They were all philosophers, my dear philosophe, all very great men, and so was Homer and Virgil, but they were poets. Yes, yes, I know all about it. But what can anybody say more than this? We are all equal, all God's children. I have ten thousand a year, but I am no more than the meanest man alive. I have no pride, and yet, my dear friend, I can say do, and it is done. Ha, 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 my dear friend. Now there's that gentleman pointing to nobility. He is a Swedish baron. You shall see. Ho! calling to the Swede. Get me, will you, a bottle of wine from the cabin? Swede. Here, Jack, go and get your master a bottle of wine from the cabin. Dane. No, 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 do you go now. You go yourself. You go now. Swede. Pah! Dane. Now go, go, I pray you. And the Swede went. After this, the Dane commenced an harangue on religion and mistaking me for unphilosoph in the continental sense of the word, he talked of deity in a declamatory style, very much resembling the devotional rants of that rude blunderer Mr. Thomas Paine in his age of reason, and whispered in my ear what damned hypocrisy all Jesus Christ's business was. I dare aver that few men have less reason to charge themselves with indulging in persiflage than myself. I should hate it if it were only that it is a Frenchman's vice, and feel a pride in avoiding it, because our own language is too honest to have a word to express it by. But in this instance the temptation had been too powerful, and I have placed it on the list of my offences. Pericles answered one of his dearest friends, who had solicited him on a case of life and death, to take an equivocal oath for his preservation. Debeo amicis opitulari sed usque ad deos. Friendship herself must place her last and boldest step on this side the altar. What Pericles would not do to save a friend's life, you may be assured, I would not hazard merely to mill the chocolate-pot of a drunken fool's vanity, till it frothed over. Assuming a serious look, I profess myself a believer, and sunk at once an hundred fathoms in his good graces. He retired to his cabin, and I wrapped myself up in my greatcoat and looked at the water. A beautiful white cloud of foam at momently intervals coursed by the side of the vessel with a roar, and little stars of flame danced and sparkled and went out in it, and every now and then light detachments of this white cloud-like foam darted off from the vessel's side, each with its own small constellation, over the sea, and scoured out of sight, like a Tartar troop over a wilderness. It was cold, the cabin was at open war with my olfactories, and I found reason to rejoice in my greatcoat, a weighty, high-caped, respectable rug, the collar of which turned over and played the part of a nightcap very passably, in looking up at two or three bright stars which oscillated with the motion of the sails. I fell asleep, but was awakened at one o'clock, Monday morning, by a shower of rain. I found myself compelled to go down into the cabin, where I slept very soundly, and awoke with a very good appetite at breakfast-time, my nostrils, the most placable of all the senses, reconciled to, or indeed insensible, of the mephitis. Monday, September 17th, I had a long conversation with the Swede, who spoke with the most poignant contempt of the Dane, whom he described as a fool, purse-mad but he confirmed the boast of the Dane respecting the largeness of his fortune, which he had acquired in the first instance as an advocate, and afterwards as a planter. From the Dane and from himself I collected that he was indeed a Swedish nobleman, who had squandered a fortune that was never very large, and had made over his property to the Dane, on whom he was now utterly dependent. He seemed to suffer very little pain from the Dane's insolence. He was in a high degree humane and attentive to the English lady, who suffered most fearfully, and for whom he performed many little offices, with a tenderness and delicacy which seemed to prove real goodness of heart. Indeed, his general manners and conversation were not only pleasing, but even interesting, and I struggle to believe his insensibility respecting the Dane, philosophical fortitude. For though the Dane was now quite sober, his character oozed out of him at every pore, and after dinner, when he was again flushed with wine, every quarter of an hour, perhaps oftener, he would shout out to the Swede, "'Ho, oh, nobility, go, do such a thing, Mr. Nobility!' tell the gentleman such a story, and so forth, with an insolence which must have excited disgust and detestation, if his vulgar rants on the sacred rights of equality, joined to his wild havoc of general grammar, no less than of the English language, had not rendered it so irresistibly laughable. At four o'clock I observed a wild duck swimming on the waves, a single solitary wild duck. It is not easy to conceive how interesting a thing it looked in that round, objectless desert of waters. I had associated such a feeling of immensity with the ocean, that I felt exceedingly disappointed, when I was out of sight of all land, at the narrowness and nearness, as it were, of the circle of the horizon. 
so little are images capable of satisfying the obscure feelings connected with words in the evening the sails were lowered lest we should run foul of the land which can be seen only at a small distance and at four o'clock on tuesday morning i was awakened by the cry of land land it was an ugly island rock at a distance on our left called heligoland well known to many passengers from yarmouth to hamburg who have been obliged by stormy weather to pass weeks and weeks in weary captivity on it stripped of all their money by the exorbitant demands of the wretches who inhabit it so at least the sailors inform me about nine o'clock we saw the mainland which seemed scarcely able to hold its head above water low flat and dreary with lighthouses and landmarks which seemed to give a character and language to the dreariness we entered the mouth of the elbe passing neuwerk though as yet the right bank only of the river was visible to us on this i saw a church and thanked god for my safe voyage not without affectionate thoughts of those i had left in england at eleven o'clock on the same morning we arrived at cuxhaven the ship dropped anchor and the boat was hoisted out to carry the hanoverian and a few others on shore the captain agreed to take us who remained to hamburg for ten guineas to which the dane contributed so largely that the other passengers paid but half a guinea each accordingly we hauled anchor and passed gently up the river at cuxhaven both sides of the river may be seen in clear weather we could now see the right bank only we passed a multitude of english traders that had been waiting many weeks for a wind in a short time both banks became visible both flat and evidencing the labour of human hands by their extreme neatness on the left bank i saw a church or two in the distance on the right bank we passed by steeple and windmill and cottage and windmill and single house windmill and windmill and neat single house and steeple these were the objects and in the succession the shores were very green and planted with trees not inelegantly thirty-five miles from cuxhaven the night came on us and as the navigation of the elbow is perilous we dropped anchor over what place thought i does the moon hang to your eye my dearest friend to me it hung over the left bank of the elbow close above the moon was a huge volume of deep black cloud while a very thin fillet crossed the middle of the orb as narrow and thin and black as a ribbon of crape the long trembling road of moonlight which lay on the water and reached to the stern of our vessel glimmered dimly and obscurely we saw two or three lights from the right bank probably from bedrooms i felt the striking contrast between the silence of this majestic stream whose banks are populous with men and women and children and flocks and herds between the silence by night of this peopled river and the ceaseless noise and uproar and loud agitations of the desolate solitude of the ocean the passengers below had all retired to their beds and i felt the interest of this quiet scene the more deeply from the circumstance of having just quitted them for the prussian had during the whole of the evening displayed all his talents to captivate the dane who had admitted him into the train of his dependents the young englishman continued to interpret the prussian's jokes to me they were all without exception profane and abominable but some sufficiently witty and a few incidents which he related in his own person were valuable as illustrating the manners of the countries in which they had taken place five o'clock on wednesday morning we hauled the anchor but were soon obliged to drop it again in consequence of the thick fog which our captain feared would continue the whole day but about nine it cleared off and we sailed slowly along close by the shore of a very beautiful island forty miles from cuxhaven the wind continuing slack this holm or island is about a mile and a half in length wedge-shaped well wooded with glades of the liveliest green and rendered more interesting by the remarkably neat farmhouse on it it seemed made for retirement without solitude a place that would allure one's friends while it precluded the impertinent calls of mere visitors the shores of the elbe now became more beautiful with rich meadows and trees running like a low wall along the river's edge and peering over them neat houses and especially on the right bank a profusion of steeple spires white black or red an instinctive taste teaches men to build their churches in flat countries with spire steeples which as they cannot be referred to any other object point as with silent finger to the sky and stars and sometimes when they reflect the brazen light of a rich though rainy sunset appear like a pyramid of flame burning heavenward i remember once and once only to have seen a spire in a narrow valley of a mountainous country the effect was not only mean but ludicrous and reminded me against my will of an extinguisher the close neighbourhood of the high mountain at the foot of which it stood had so completely dwarfed it and deprived it of all connection with the sky or clouds forty-six english miles from cuxhaven and sixteen from hamburg the danish village vader ornaments the left bank with its black steeple and close by it is the wild and pastoral hamlet of schulau 
hitherto both the right and left bank, green to the very brink, and level with the river, resembled the shores of a park canal. The trees and houses were alike low, sometimes the low trees overtopping the yet lower houses, sometimes the low houses rising above the yet lower trees. But at Shulau, the left bank rises at once forty or fifty feet, and stares on the river with its perpendicular façade of sand, thinly patched with tufts of green. The Elbe continued to present a more and more lively spectacle, from the multitude of fishing-boats and the flocks of seagulls wheeling round them, the clamorous rivals and companions of the fishermen, till we came to Blancones, a most interesting village, scattered amid scattered trees, over three hills in three divisions. Each of the three hills stares upon the river with faces of bare sand, with which the boats with their bare poles, standing in files along the banks, made a sort of fantastic harmony. Between each façade lies a green and woody dell, each deeper than the other. In short, it is a large village made up of individual cottages, each cottage in the centre of its own little wood or orchard, and each with its own separate path, a village with a labyrinth of paths, or rather a neighbourhood of houses. It is inhabited by fishermen and boat-makers, the Blankenese boats being in great request through the whole navigation of the Elbe. Here first we saw the spires of Hamburg, and from hence, as far as Altona, the left bank of the Elbe is uncommonly pleasing, considered as the vicinity of an industrious and republican city. In that style of beauty, or rather prettiness, that might tempt the citizen into the country, and yet gratify the taste which he had acquired in the town. Summer-houses and Chinese show-work are everywhere scattered along the high and green banks, the boards of the farmhouses left unplastered and gaily painted with green and yellow and scarcely a tree not cut into shapes and made to remind the human being of his own power and intelligence instead of the wisdom of nature still however these are links of connection between town and country and far better than the affectation of tastes and enjoyments for which men's habits have disqualified them passing by on saturdays and sundays with the burghers of hamburg smoking their pipes the women and children feasting in the alcoves of box and yew and it becomes a nature of its own on wednesday four o'clock we left the vessel, and passing with trouble through the huge masses of shipping that seemed to choke the wide Elbe from Altona upward, we were at length landed at the Boom House, Hamburg. End of letter one. Saturain's Letters, Letter two, of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Saturday's Letters, Letter Two, to a Lady, Ratzeburg, meine liebe Freundin. See how natural the German comes for me, though I have not yet been six weeks in the country, almost as fluently as English from my neighbour, the Amtschreiber or public secretary, who, as often as we meet, though it should be half a dozen times in the same day, never fails to greet me with "Damn your plut und eyes, my dearest Englander, wie goes it?" which is certainly a proof of great generosity on his part these words being his whole stock of english i had however a better reason than the desire of displaying my proficiency for i wish to put you in good humour with a language from the acquirement of which i have promised myself much edification and the means too of communicating a new pleasure to you and your sister during our winter readings and how can i do this better than by pointing out its gallant attention to the ladies our english affix s is i believe confined either to words derived from the latin as actress directress etc or from the french as mistress duchess and the like but the german in enables us to designate the sex in every possible relation of life thus the amtmann's lady is the frau amtmannin the secretary's wife by the by the handsomest woman i have yet seen in germany is die allerliebste frau amtschreiberin the colonel's lady die frau obristin or Connellerin, and even the parson's wife die frau pastorin but i am especially pleased with their freundin which unlike the amica of the romans is seldom used but in its best and purest sense now i know it will be said that a friend is already something more than a friend when a man feels an anxiety to express to himself that this friend is a female but this i deny in that sense at least in which the objection will be made i would hazard the impeachment of heresy rather than abandon my belief that there is a sex in our souls as well as in their perishable garments and he who does not feel it never truly loved a sister nay is not capable even of loving a wife as she deserves to be loved if she indeed be worthy of that holy name now i know my gentle friend what you are murmuring to yourself this is so like him running away after the first bubble that chance has blown off from the surface of his fancy when one is anxious to learn where he is and what he has seen well then 
that i am settled at ratzeburg with my motives and the particulars of my journey hither will inform you my first letter to him with which doubtless he has edified your whole fireside left me safely landed at hamburg on the elbe stairs at the boom house while standing on the stairs i was amused by the contents of the passage boat which crosses the river once or twice a day from hamburg to harburg it was stowed close with all people of all nations in all sorts of dresses the men all with pipes in their mouths and these pipes of all shapes and fancies straight and wreathed simple and complex long and short cane clay porcelain wood tin silver and ivory most of them with silver chains and silver bowl covers pipes and boots are the first universal characteristic of the male hamburgers that would strike the eye of a raw traveller but i forget my promise of journalising as much as possible therefore september nineteenth afternoon my companion who you recollect speaks the french language with unusual propriety had formed a kind of confidential acquaintance with the emigrant who appeared to be a man of sense and whose manners were those of a perfect gentleman he seemed about fifty or rather more whatever is unpleasant in french manners from excess in the degree had been softened down by age or affliction and all that is delightful in the kind alacrity and delicacy in little attentions etc remained and without bustle gesticulation or disproportionate eagerness his demeanour exhibited the minute philanthropy of a polished frenchman tempered by the sobriety of the english character disunited from its reserve there is something strangely attractive in the character of a gentleman when you apply the word emphatically and yet in that sense of the term which it is more easy to feel than to define it neither includes the possession of high moral excellence nor of necessity even the ornamental graces of manner i have now in my mind's eye a person whose life would scarcely stand scrutiny even in the court of honour much less in that of conscience and his manners if nicely observed would of the two excite an idea of awkwardness rather than of elegance and yet every one who conversed with him felt and acknowledged the gentleman the secret of the matter i believe to be this we feel the gentlemanly character present to us whenever under all the circumstances of social intercourse the trivial not less than the important through the whole detail of his manners and deportment and with the ease of a habit a person shows respect to others in such a way as at the same time implies in his own feelings an habitual and assured anticipation of reciprocal respect from them to himself in short the gentlemanly character arises out of the feeling of equality acting as a habit yet flexible to the varieties of rank and modified without being disturbed or superseded by them this description will perhaps explain to you the ground of one of your own remarks as i was englishing to you the interesting dialogue concerning the causes of the corruption of eloquence what perfect gentlemen these old romans must have been i was impressed i remember with the same feeling at the time i was reading a translation of cicero's philosophical dialogues and of his epistolary correspondence while in pliny's letters i seemed to have a different feeling he gave me the notion of a very fine gentleman you uttered the words as if you had felt that the adjunct had injured the substance and the increased degree altered the kind pliny was the courtier of an absolute monarch cicero an aristocratic republican for this reason the character of gentleman in the sense to which i have confined it is frequent in england rare in france and found where it is found in age or the latest period of manhood while in germany the character is almost unknown but the proper antipathy of a gentleman is to be sought for among the anglo-american democrats i owe this digression as an act of justice to this amiable frenchman and of humiliation for myself for in a little controversy between us on the subject of french poetry he made me feel my own ill behaviour by the silent reproof of contrast and when i afterwards apologised to him for the warmth of my language he answered me with a cheerful expression of surprise and an immediate compliment which a gentleman might both make with dignity and receive with pleasure i was pleased therefore to find it agreed on that we should if possible take up our quarters in the same house my friend went with him in search of an hotel and i to deliver my letters of recommendation i walked onward at a brisk pace enlivened not so much by anything i actually saw as by the confused sense that i was for the first time in my life on the continent of our planet i seemed to myself like a liberated bird that had been hatched in an aviary who now after his first soar of freedom poises himself in the upper air very naturally i began to wonder at all things some for being so like and some for being so unlike the things in england dutch women with large umbrella hats shooting out half a yard before them with a prodigal plumpness of petticoat behind the women of hamburg with caps plaited on the call with silver or gold or both bordered round with stiffened lace which stood out before their eyes but not lower so that the eyes sparkled through it the hanoverian with the fore part of the head bare then a stiff lace standing up like a wall perpendicular on the cap and the cap behind tailed with an enormous quantity of ribbon which lies or tosses on the back their visnomies seemed like a goodly banner 
spread in defiance of all enemies the ladies all in english dresses all rouged and all with bad teeth which you notice instantly from their contrast to the almost animal too glossy mother-of-pearl whiteness and the regularity of the teeth of the laughing loud-talking countrywomen and servant girls who with their clean white stockings and with slippers without heel quarters tripped along the dirty streets as if they were secured by a charm from the dirt with a lightness too which surprised me who had always considered it as one of the annoyances of sleeping in an inn that i had to clatter upstairs in a pair of them the streets narrow to my english nose sufficiently offensive and explaining at first sight the universal use of boots without any appropriate path for the foot passengers the gable ends of the houses all towards the street some in the ordinary triangular form and entire as the botanists say but the greater number notched and scalloped with more than chinese grotesqueness above all i was struck with the profusion of windows so large and so many that the houses look all glass mr pitt's window tax with its pretty little additionals sprouting out from it like young toadlets on the back of a surinam toad would certainly improve the appearance of the hamburg houses which have a slight summer look not in keeping with their size incongruous with the climate and precluding that feeling of retirement and self-content which one wishes to associate with a house in a noisy city but a conflagration would i fear be the previous requisite to the production of any architectural beauty in hamburg for verily it is a filthy town i moved on and crossed a multitude of ugly bridges with huge black deformities of water-wheels close by them the water intersects the city everywhere and would have furnished to the genius of italy the capabilities of all that is most beautiful and magnificent in architecture it might have been the rival of venice and it is huddle and ugliness stench and stagnation the jungferstieg that is young ladies walk to which my letters directed me made an exception it was a walk or promenade planted with treble rows of elm trees which being yearly pruned and cropped remained slim and dwarf-like this walk occupies one side of a square piece of water with many swans on it perfectly tame and moving among the swans shoey pleasure-boats with ladies in them rowed by their husbands or lovers some paragraphs have been here omitted thus embarrassed by sad and solemn politeness still more than by broken english it sounded like the voice of an old friend when i heard the emigrant servant inquiring after me he had come for the purpose of guiding me to our hotel through streets and streets i pressed on as happy as a child and i doubt not with a childish expression of wonderment in my busy eyes amused by the wicker wagons with movable benches across them one behind the other these were the hackney coaches amused by the signboards of the shops on which all the articles sold within are painted and that too very exactly though in a grotesque confusion a useful substitute for language in this great mart of nations amused with the incessant tinkling of the shop and house-door bells the bell hanging over each door and struck with a small iron rod at every entrance and exit and finally amused by looking in at the windows as i passed along the ladies and gentlemen drinking coffee or playing cards and the gentlemen all smoking i wished myself a painter that i might have sent you a sketch of one of the card parties the long pipe of one gentleman rested on the table its bowl half a yard from his mouth fuming like a censer by the fish-pool the other gentleman who was dealing the cards and of course had both hands employed held his pipe in his teeth which hanging down between his knees smoked beside his ankles hogarth himself never drew a more ludicrous distortion both of attitude and physiognomy than this effort occasioned nor was there wanting beside it one of those beautiful female faces which the same hogarth in whom the satirist never extinguished that love of beauty which belonged to him as a poet so often and so gladly introduces as the central figure in a crowd of humorous deformities which figures such is the power of true genius neither acts nor is meant to act as a contrast but diffuses through all and over each of the group a spirit of reconciliation and human kindness and even when the attention is no longer consciously directed to the cause of this feeling still blends its tenderness with our laughter and thus prevents the instructive merriment at the whims of nature or the foibles or humours of our fellow-men from degenerating into the heart poison of contempt or hatred our hotel die wilde Mann, the sign of which was no bad likeness of the landlord who had engrafted on a very grim face a restless grin that was at every man's service and which indeed like an actor rehearsing to himself he kept playing in expectation of an occasion for it neither our hotel i say nor its landlord were of the genteelest class but it has one great advantage for a stranger by being in the market-place and the next neighbour of the huge church of st nicholas a church with shops and houses built up against it out of which wens and warts its high massy steeple rises necklace near the top with a round of large gilt balls a better pole-star could scarcely be desired long shall i retain the impression made on my mind by the awful echo so loud and long and tremulous 
of the deep-toned clock within this church which awoke me at two in the morning from a distressful dream occasioned i believe by the feather bed which is used here instead of bedclothes i will rather carry my blanket about with me like a wild indian than submit to this abominable custom our emigrant acquaintance was we found an intimate friend of the celebrated abbe de lille and from the large fortune which he possessed under the monarchy had rescued sufficient not only for independence but for respectability he had offended some of his fellow emigrants in london whom he had obliged with considerable sums by a refusal to make further advances and in consequence of their intrigues had received an order to quit the kingdom i thought it one proof of his innocence that he attached no blame either to the alien act or to the minister who had exerted it against him and a still greater that he spoke of london with rapture and of his favourite niece who had married and settled in england with all the fervour and all the pride of a fond parent a man sent by force out of a country obliged to sell out of the stocks at a great loss and exiled from those pleasures and that style of society which habit had rendered essential to his happiness whose predominant feelings were yet all of a private nature resentment for friendship outraged and anguish for domestic affections interrupted such a man i think i could dare warrant guiltless of espionage in any service most of all in that of the present french directory he spoke with ecstasy of paris under the monarchy and yet the particular facts which made up his description left as deep a conviction on my mind of french worthlessness as his own tale had done of emigrant ingratitude since my arrival in germany i have not met a single person even among those who abhor the revolution that spoke with favour or even charity of the french emigrants though the belief of their influence in the organization of this disastrous war from the horrors of which north germany deems itself only reprieved not secured may have some share in the general aversion with which they are regarded yet i am deeply persuaded that the far greater part is owing to their own profligacy to their treachery and hard-heartedness to each other and the domestic misery or corrupt principles which so many of them have carried into the families of their protectors my heart dilated with honest pride as i recall to mind the stern yet amiable characters of the english patriots who sought refuge on the continent at the restoration oh let not our civil war under the first charles be paralleled with the french revolution in the former the character overflowed from excess of principle in the latter from the fermentation of the dregs the former was a civil war between the virtues and virtuous prejudices of the two parties the latter between the vices the venetian glass of the french monarchy shivered and flew asunder with the working of a double poison september twentieth i was introduced to mr klopstock the brother of the poet who again introduced me to professor eberling an intelligent and lively man though deaf so deaf indeed that it was a painful effort to talk with him as we were obliged to drop our pearls into a huge ear-trumpet from this courteous and kind-hearted man of letters i hope the german literati in general may resemble this first specimen i heard a tolerable italian pun and an interesting anecdote when bonaparte was in italy having been irritated by some instance of perfidy he said in a loud and vehement tone in a public company tis a true proverb gli italiani tutti ladroni and that is the italians all plunderers a lady had the courage to reply non tutti ma buona parte not all but a good part or bonaparte this i confess sounded to my ears as one of the many good things that might have been said the anecdote is more valuable for it instances the ways and means of french insinuation hoche had received much information concerning the face of the country from a map of unusual fullness and accuracy the maker of which he heard resided at dusseldorf at the storming of dusseldorf by the french army Hoche previously ordered that the house and property of this man should be preserved, and entrusted the performance of the order to an officer on whose troop he could rely. Finding afterwards that the man had escaped before the storming commenced, Hosh exclaimed, He had no reason to flee. It is for such men, not against them, that the French nation makes war, and consents to shed the blood of its children. You remember Milton's sonnet. The great Imathian conqueror bid spare the house of Pindarus when temple and tower went to the ground now though the dusseldorf map-maker may stand in the same relation to the theban bard as the snail that marks its path by lines of film on the wall it creeps over to the eagle that soars sunward and beats the tempest with its wings it does not therefore follow that the jacobin of france may not be as valiant a general and as good a politician as the madman of macedon from professor Eberling's, mr klopstock accompanied my friend and me to his own house where i saw a fine bust of his brother there was a solemn and heavy greatness in his countenance which corresponded to my preconceptions of his style and genius i saw there likewise a very fine portrait of lessing whose works are at present the chief object of my admiration his eyes were uncommonly like mine if anything 
rather larger and more prominent but the lower part of his face and his nose oh what an exquisite expression of elegance and sensibility there appeared no depth weight or comprehensiveness in the forehead the whole face seemed to say that lessing was a man of quick and voluptuous feelings of an active but light fancy acute yet acute not in the observation of actual life but in the arrangements and management of the ideal world that is in taste and in metaphysics i assure you that i wrote these very words in my memorandum book with the portrait before my eyes and when i knew nothing of lessing but his name and that he was a german writer of eminence we consumed two hours and more over a bad dinner at the table d'hote patience at a german ordinary smiling at time the germans are the worst cooks in europe there is place for every two persons a bottle of common wine rhenish and claret alternately but in the houses of the opulent during the many and long intervals of the dinner the servants hand round glasses of richer wines at the lord of culpin's they came in this order burgundy madeira port frontiniac pacchiaretti old hock mountain champagne hock again bishop and lastly punch a tolerable quantum methinks the last dish at the ordinary viz slices of roast pork for all the larger dishes are brought in cut up and first handed round and then set on the table with stewed prunes and other sweet fruits and this followed by cheese and butter with plates of apples reminded me of shakespeare and shakespeare put it in my head to go to the french comedy bless me why it is worse than our modern english plays the first act informed me that a court-martial is to be held on a count vatron who had drawn his sword on the colonel his brother-in-law the officers plead in his behalf in vain his wife the colonel's sister pleads with most tempestuous agonies in vain she falls into hysterics and faints away to the dropping of the inner curtain in the second act sentence of death is passed on the count his wife as frantic and hysterical as before more so good industrious creature as she could not be the third and last act the wife still frantic very frantic indeed the soldiers just about to fire the handkerchief actually dropped when reprieve reprieve is heard from behind the scenes and in comes prince somebody pardons the count and the wife is still frantic only with joy that was all oh dear lady this is one of the cases in which laughter is followed by melancholy for such is the kind of drama which is now substituted everywhere for shakespeare and racine you well know that i offer violence to my own feelings in joining these names but however meanly i may think of the french serious drama even in its most perfect specimens and with whatever right i may complain of its perpetual falsification of the language and of the connections and transitions of thought which nature has appropriated to states of passion still however the french tragedies are consistent works of art and the offspring of great intellectual power preserving a fitness in the parts and a harmony in the whole they form a nature of their own though a false nature still they excite the minds of the spectators to active thought to a striving after ideal excellence the soul is not stupefied into mere sensations by worthless sympathy with our own ordinary sufferings or an empty curiosity for the surprising undignified by the language or the situations which awe and delight the imagination what i would ask of the crowd that press forward to the pantomimic tragedies and weeping comedies of kotzebue and his imitators what are you seeking is it comedy but in the comedy of shakespeare and moliere the more accurate my knowledge and the more profoundly i think the greater is the satisfaction that mingles with my laughter for though the qualities which these writers portray are ludicrous indeed either from the kind or the excess and exquisitely ludicrous yet are they the natural growth of the human mind and such as with more or less change in the drapery i can apply to my own heart or at least to whole classes of my fellow-creatures how often are not the moralist and the metaphysician obliged for the happiest illustrations of general truths and the subordinate laws of human thought and action to quotations not only from the tragic characters but equally from the jakes falstaff and even from the fools and clowns of shakespeare or from the miser hypochondriast and hypocrite of moliere say not that i am recommending abstractions for these class characteristics which constitute the instructiveness of a character are so modified and particularized in each person of the shakespearean drama that life itself does not excite more distinctly that sense of individuality which belongs to real existence paradoxical as it may sound one of the essential properties of geometry is not less essential to dramatic excellence and if i may mention his name without pedantry to a lady aristotle has accordingly required of the poet an involution of the universal in the individual the chief differences are that in geometry it is the universal truth itself which is uppermost in the consciousness in poetry the individual form in which the truth is clothed with the ancients and not less with the elder dramatists of england and france both comedy and tragedy were considered as kinds of poetry they neither sought in comedy to make us laugh merely 
much less to make us laugh by wry faces accidents of jargon slang phrases for the day or the clothing of commonplace morals in metaphors drawn from the shops or mechanic occupations of their characters nor did they condescend in tragedy to wheedle away the applause of the spectators by representing before them facsimiles of their own mean selves in all their existing meanness or to work on their sluggish sympathies by a pathos not a whit more respectable than the maudlin tears of drunkenness their tragic scenes were meant to affect us indeed but within the bounds of pleasure and in union with the activity both of our understanding and imagination they wished to transport the mind to a sense of its possible greatness and to implant the germs of that greatness during the temporary oblivion of the worthless thing we are and of the peculiar state in which each man happens to be suspending our individual recollections and lulling them to sleep amid the music of nobler thought hold methinks i hear the spokesman of the crowd reply and we will listen to him i am the plaintiff and he the defendant defendant hold are not our modern sentimental plays filled with the best christian morality plaintiff yes just as much of it and just that part of it which you can exercise without a single christian virtue without a single sacrifice that is really painful to you just as much as flatters you sends you away pleased with your own hearts and quite reconciled to your vices which can never be thought very ill of when they keep such good company and walk hand in hand with so much compassion and generosity adulation so loathsome that you would spit in the man's face who dared offer it to you in a private company unless you interpreted it as insulting irony you appropriate with infinite satisfaction when you share the garbage with a whole sty and gobble it out of a common trough no caesar must pace your boards no antony no royal dane no orestes no andromache d no or as few of them as possible what has a plain citizen of london or hamburg to do with your kings and queens and your old schoolboy pagan heroes besides everybody knows the stories and what curiosity can we feel p what sir not for the manner not for the delightful language of the poet not for the situations the action and reaction of the passions d you are hasty sir the only curiosity we feel is in the story and how can we be anxious concerning the end of a play or be surprised by it when we know how it will turn out p your pardon for having interrupted you we now understand each other you seek then in a tragedy which wise men of old held for the highest effort of human genius the same gratification as that you receive from a new novel the last german romance and other dainties of the day which can be enjoyed but once if you carry these feelings to the sister art of painting michelangelo's sistine chapel and the scripture gallery of raphael can expect no favour from you you know all about them beforehand and are doubtless more familiar with the subjects of those paintings than with the tragic tales of the historic or heroic ages there is a consistency therefore in your preference of contemporary writers for the great men of former times those at least who were deemed great by our ancestors sought so little to gratify this kind of curiosity that they seem to have regarded the story in a not much higher light than the painter regards his canvas as that on not by which they were to display their appropriate excellence no work resembling a tale or romance can well show less variety of invention in the incidents or less anxiety in weaving them together than the don quixote of cervantes its admirers feel the disposition to go back and reperuse some preceding chapter at least ten times for once that they find any eagerness to hurry forwards or open the book on those parts which they best recollect even as we visit those friends oftenest whom we loved most and with whose characters and actions we are the most intimately acquainted in the divine ariosto as his countrymen call this their darling poet i question whether there be a single tale of his own invention or the elements of which were not familiar to the readers of old romance i will pass by the ancient greeks who thought it even necessary to the fable of a tragedy and that its substance should be previously known that there had been at least fifty tragedies with the same title would be one of the motives which determined sophocles and euripides in the choice of electra as a subject but milton d ay milton indeed but do not dr johnson and other great men tell us that nobody now reads milton but as a task p so much the worse for them of whom this can be truly said but why then do you pretend to admire shakespeare the greater part if not all of his dramas were as far as the names and the main instants are concerned already stock plays all the stories at least on which they are built pre-existed in the chronicles ballads or translations of contemporary or preceding english writers why i repeat do you pretend to admire shakespeare is it perhaps that you only pretend to admire him however as one for all you have dismissed the well-known events and personages of history or the epic muse what have you taken in their stead whom has your tragic muse armed with her bowl and dagger the sentimental muse i should have said whom you have seated in the throne of tragedy what heroes has she reared on her buskins 
d oh our good friends and next-door neighbours honest tradesmen valiant tars high-spirited half-pay officers philanthropic jews virtuous courtesans tender-hearted braziers and sentimental rat-catchers a little bluff or so but all our very generous tender-hearted characters are a little rude or misanthropic and all our misanthropes very tender-hearted p but i pray you friend in what actions great or interesting can such men be engaged d they give away a great deal of money find rich dowries for young men and maidens who have all other good qualities they browbeat lords baronets and justices of the peace for they are as bold as hector they rescue stage-coaches at the instant they are falling down precipices carry away infants in the sight of opposing armies and some of our performers act a muscular able-bodied man to such perfection that our dramatic poets who always have the actors in their eye seldom fail to make their favourite male character as strong as samson and then they take such prodigious leaps and what is done on the stage is more striking even than what is acted i once remember such a deafening explosion that i could not hear a word of the play for half an act after it and a little real gunpowder being set fire to at the same time and smelt by all the spectators the naturalness of the scene was quite astonishing p but how can you connect with such men and such actions that dependence of thousands on the fate of one which gives so lofty an interest to the personages of shakespeare and the greek tragedians how can you connect with them that sublimest of all feelings the power of destiny and the controlling might of heaven which seems to elevate the characters which sink beneath its irresistible blow d oh mere fancies we seek and find on the present stage our own wants and passions our own vexations losses and embarrassments p it is your own poor petty fogging nature then which you desire to have represented before you not human nature in its height and vigour but surely you might find the former with all its joys and sorrows more conveniently in your own houses and parishes d true but here comes a difference fortune is blind but the poet has his eyes open and is besides as complaisant as fortune is capricious he makes everything turn out exactly as we would wish it he gratifies us by representing those as hateful or contemptible whom we hate and wish to despise p aside that is he gratifies your envy by libelling your superiors d he makes all those precise moralists who affect to be better than their neighbours turn out at last abject hypocrites traitors and hard-hearted villains and your men of spirit who take their girl in their glass with equal freedom prove the true men of honour and that no part of the audience may remain unsatisfied reform in the last scene and leave no doubt in the minds of the ladies that they will make most faithful and excellent husbands though it does seem a pity that they should be obliged to get rid of qualities which had made them so interesting besides the poor become rich all at once and in the final matrimonial choice the opulent and high-born themselves are made to confess that virtue is the only true nobility and that a lovely woman is a dowry of herself p excellent but you have forgotten those brilliant flashes of loyalty those patriotic praises of the king and old england which especially if conveyed in a metaphor from the ship or the shop so often solicit and so unfailingly receive the public plaudit i give your prudence credit for the omission for the whole system of your drama is a moral and intellectual jacobinism of the most dangerous kind and those commonplace rants of loyalty are no better than hypocrisy in your playwrights and your own sympathy with them a gross self-delusion for the whole secret of dramatic popularity consists with you in the confusion and subversion of the natural order of things their causes and their effects in the excitement of surprise by representing the qualities of liberality refined feeling and a nice sense of honour those things rather which pass among you for such in persons and in classes of life where experience teaches us least to expect them and in rewarding with all the sympathies that are the dues of virtue those criminals whom law reason and religion have excommunicated from our esteem and now good-night truly i might have written this last sheet without having gone to germany but i fancied myself talking to you by your own fireside and can you think it a small pleasure to me to forget now and then that i am not there besides you and my other good friends have made up your minds to me as i am and from whatever place i write you will expect that part of my travels will consist of excursions in my own mind end of saturain's letters letter two saturain's letters letter three of biographia literaria this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee biographia literaria by samuel taylor coleridge saturday's letters letter three ratzeburg no little fish thrown back again into the water no fly unimprisoned from a child's hand could more buoyantly enjoy its element than i this clean and peaceful house 
with this lovely view of the town groves and lake of ratzeburg from the window at which i am writing my spirit certainly and my health i fancied were beginning to sink under the noise dirt and unwholesome air of our hamburg hotel i left it on sunday september twenty third with a letter of introduction from the poet klopstock to the amtmann of ratzeburg the amtmann received me with kindness and introduced me to the worthy pastor who agreed to board and lodge me for any length of time not less than a month the vehicle in which i took my place was considerably larger than an english stage-coach to which it bore much the same proportion and rude resemblance that an elephant's ear does to the human its top was composed of naked boards of different colours and seeming to have been parts of different wainscots instead of windows there were leathern curtains with a little eye of glass in each they perfectly answered the purpose of keeping out the prospect and letting in the cold i could observe little therefore but the inns and farmhouses at which we stopped they were all alike except in size one great room like a barn with a hayloft over it the straw and hay dangling in tufts through the boards which formed the ceiling of the room and the floor of the loft from this room which is paved like a street sometimes one sometimes two smaller ones are enclosed at one end these are commonly floored in the large room the cattle pigs poultry men women and children live in amicable community yet there was an appearance of cleanliness and rustic comfort one of these houses i measured it was an hundred feet in length and the apartments were taken off from one corner between these and the stalls there was a small interspace and here the breadth was forty-eight feet but thirty-two where the stalls were of course the stalls were on each side eight feet in depth the faces of the cows etc were turned towards the room indeed they were in it so that they had at least the comfort of seeing each other's faces stall feeding is universal in this part of germany a practice concerning which the agriculturist and the poet are likely to entertain opposite opinions or at least to have very different feelings the woodwork of these buildings on the outside is left unplastered as in old houses among us and being painted red and green it cuts and tessellates the buildings very gaily from within three miles of hamburg almost to moln which is thirty miles from it the country as far as i could see it was a dead flat only varied by woods at moln it became more beautiful i observed a small lake nearly surrounded with groves and a palace in view belonging to the king of great britain and inhabited by the inspector of the forests we were nearly the same time in travelling the thirty-five miles from hamburg to ratzeburg as we had been in going from london to yarmouth one hundred and twenty-six miles the lake of ratzeburg runs from south to north about nine miles in length and varying in breadth from three miles to half a mile about a mile from the southernmost point it is divided into two of course very unequal parts by an island which being connected by a bridge and a narrow slip of land with the one shore and by another bridge of immense length with the other shore forms a complete isthmus on this island the town of ratzeburg is built the pastor's house of vicarage together with the amtmann's amtschreibers and the church stands near the summit of a hill which slopes down to the slip of land and the little bridge from which through a superb military gate you step into the island town of ratzeburg this again is itself a little hill by ascending and descending which you arrive at the long bridge and so to the other shore the water to the south of the town is called the little lake which however almost engrosses the beauties of the whole the shores being just often enough green and bare to give the proper effect to the magnificent groves which occupy the greater part of their circumference from the turnings windings and indentations of the shore the views vary almost every ten steps and the whole has a sort of majestic beauty a feminine grandeur at the north of the great lake and peeping over it i see the seven church towers of lubeck at the distance of twelve or thirteen miles yet as distinctly as if they were not three the only defect in the view is that ratzeburg is built entirely of red bricks and all the houses roofed with red tiles to the eye therefore it presents a clump of brick dust red yet this evening october tenth twenty minutes past five i saw the town perfectly beautiful and the whole softened down into complete keeping if i may borrow a term from the painters the sky over ratzeburg and all the east was a pure evening blue while over the west it was covered with light sandy clouds hence a deep red light spread over the whole prospect in undisturbed harmony with the red town the brown red woods and the yellow red reeds on the skirts of the lake two or three boats with single persons paddling them floated up and down in the rich light which not only was itself in harmony with all but brought all into harmony i should have told you that i went back to hamburg on thursday september twenty seventh to take leave of my friend who travelled southward and returned hither on the monday following from Empfelde, a village half way from ratzeburg i walked to hamburg through deep sandy roads and a dreary flat the soil everywhere white hungry and excessively pulverized but the approach to the city is pleasing 
light cool country houses which you can look through and see the gardens behind them with arbours and trellis work and thick vegetable walls and trees and cloisters and piazzas each house with neat rails before it and green seats within the rails every object whether the growth of nature or the work of man was neat and artificial it pleased me far better than if the houses and gardens and pleasure fields had been in a nobler taste for this nobler taste would have been mere apery the busy anxious money-loving merchant of hamburg could only have adopted he could not have enjoyed the simplicity of nature the mind begins to love nature by imitating human conveniences in nature but this is a step in intellect though a low one and were it not so yet all around me spoke of innocent enjoyment and sensitive comforts and i entered with unscrupulous sympathy into the enjoyments and comforts even of the busy anxious money-loving merchants of hamburg in this charitable and catholic mood i reached the vast ramparts of the city these are huge green cushions one rising above the other with trees growing in the interspaces pledges and symbols of a long peace of my return i have nothing worth communicating except that i took extra post which answers to posting in england these north german post chases are uncovered wicker carts an english dust-cart is a piece of finery a chef d'oeuvre of mechanism compared with them and the horses a savage might use their ribs instead of his fingers for a numeration table wherever we stopped the postilion fed his cattle with the brown rye bread of which he eat himself all breakfasting together only the horses had no gin to their water and the postilion no water to his gin now and henceforward for subjects of more interest to you and to the objects in search of which i left you namely the literati and literature of germany believe me i walked with an impression of awe on my spirits as w and myself accompanied mr klopstock to the house of his brother the poet which stands about a quarter of a mile from the city gate it is one of a row of little commonplace summer-houses for so they looked with four or five rows of young meagre elm-trees before the windows beyond which is a green and then a dead flat intersected with several roads whatever beauty thought i may be before the poet's eyes at present it must certainly be purely of his own creation we waited a few minutes in a neat little parlour ornamented with the figures of two of the muses and with prints the subjects of which were from klopstock's odes the poet entered i was much disappointed in his countenance and recognised in it no likeness to the bust there was no comprehension in the forehead no weight over the eyebrows no expression of peculiarity moral or intellectual on the eyes no massiveness in the general countenance he is if anything rather below the middle size he wore very large half-boots which his legs filled so fearfully were they swollen however though neither w nor myself could discover any indications of sublimity or enthusiasm in his physiognomy we were both equally impressed with his liveliness and his kind and ready courtesy he talked in french with my friend and with difficulty spoke a few sentences to me in english his enunciation was not in the least affected by the entire want of his upper teeth the conversation began on his part by the expression of his rapture at the surrender of the detachment of french troops under general humbert their proceedings in ireland with regard to the committee which they had appointed with the rest of their organizing system seemed to have given the poet great entertainment he then declared his sanguine belief in nelson's victory and anticipated its confirmation with a keen and triumphant pleasure his words tones looks implied the most vehement anti-gallicanism the subject changed to literature and i inquired in latin concerning the history of german poetry and the elder german poets to my great astonishment he confessed that he knew very little on the subject he had indeed occasionally read one or two of their elder writers but not so as to enable him to speak of their merits professor eberling he said would probably give me every information of this kind the subject had not particularly excited his curiosity he then talked of milton and glover and thought glover's blank verse superior to milton's w and myself expressed our surprise and my friend gave his definition and notion of harmonious verse that it consisted the english iambic blank verse above all in the apt arrangement of pauses and cadences and the sweep of whole paragraphs with many a winding bout of link sweetness long drawn out and not in the even flow much less in the prominence of antithetic vigour of single lines which were indeed injurious to the total effect except where they were introduced for some specific purpose klopstock assented and said that he meant to confine glover's superiority to single lines he told us that he had read milton in a prose translation when he was fourteen i understood him thus myself and w interpreted klopstock's french as i had already construed it he appeared to know very little of milton or indeed of our poets in general he spoke with great indignation of the english prose translation of his messiah all the translations had been bad very bad but the english was no translation there were pages on pages not in the original and half the original was not to be found in the translation w told him that i intended to translate a few of his odes as specimens of german lyrics 
he then said to me in english i wish you would render into english some select passages of the messiah and revenge me of your countrymen it was the liveliest thing which he produced in the whole conversation he told us that his first ode was fifty years older than his last i looked at him with much emotion i considered him as the venerable father of german poetry as a good man as a christian seventy-four years old with legs enormously swollen yet active lively cheerful and kind and communicative my eyes felt as if a tear was swelling into them in the portrait of lessing there was a toupee periwig which enormously injured the effect of his physiognomy klopstock wore the same powdered and frizzled by the by old men ought never to wear powder the contrast between a large snow-white wig and the colour of an old man's skin is disgusting and wrinkles in such a neighbourhood appear only channels for dirt it is an honour to poets and great men that you think of them as parts of nature and anything of trick and fashion wounds you in them as much as when you see venerable ewes clipped into miserable peacocks the author of the messiah should have worn his own grey hair his powder and periwig were to the eye what mr virgil would be to the ear Klopstock dwelt much on the superior power which the German language possessed of concentrating meaning. He said he had often translated parts of Homer and Virgil line by line, and a German line proved always sufficient for a Greek or Latin one. In English you cannot do this. I answered that in English we could commonly render one Greek heroic line in a line and a half of our common heroic metre, and I conjectured that this line and a half would be found to contain no more syllables than one German or Greek hexameter he did not understand me and i who wished to hear his opinions not to correct them was glad that he did not we now took our leave at the beginning of the french revolution klopstock wrote odes of congratulation he received some honorary presents from the french republic a golden crown i believe and like our priestly was invited to a seat in the legislature which he declined but when french liberty metamorphosed herself into a fury he sent back these presents with a palinodia declaring his abhorrence of their proceedings and since then he has been perhaps more than enough an anti-gallican i mean that in his just contempt and detestation of the crimes and follies of the revolutionists he suffers himself to forget that the revolution itself is a process of the divine providence and that as the folly of men is the wisdom of god so are their iniquities instruments of his goodness from klopstock's house we walked to the ramparts discoursing together on the poet and his conversation till our attention was diverted to the beauty and singularity of the sunset and its effects on the objects around us there were woods in the distance a rich sandy light nay of a much deeper colour than sandy lay over these woods that blackened in the blaze over that part of the woods which lay immediately under the intenser light a brassy mist floated the trees on the ramparts and the people moving to and fro between them were cut or divided into equal segments of deep shade and brassy light had the trees and the bodies of the men and women been divided into equal segments by a rule or pair of compasses the portions could not have been more regular all else was obscure it was a fairy scene and to increase its romantic character among the moving objects thus divided into alternate shade and brightness was a beautiful child dressed with the elegant simplicity of an english child riding on a stately goat the saddle bridle and other accoutrements of which were in a high degree costly and splendid before i quit the subject of hamburg let me say that i remained a day or two longer than i otherwise should have done in order to be present at the feast of st michael the patron saint of hamburg expecting to see the civic pomp of this commercial republic i was however disappointed there were no processions two or three sermons were preached to two or three old women in two or three churches and st michael and his patronage wished elsewhere by the higher classes all places of entertainment theatre etc being shut up on this day in hamburg there seems to be no religion at all in lubeck it is confined to the women the men seem determined to be divorced from their wives in the other world if they cannot in this you will not easily conceive a more singular sight than is presented by the vast aisle of the principal church at lubeck seen from the organ loft for being filled with female servants and persons in the same class of life and all their caps having gold and silver calls it appears like a rich pavement of gold and silver i will conclude this letter with the mere transcription of notes which my friend w made of his conversations with klopstock during the interviews that took place after my departure on these i shall make but one remark at present and that will appear a presumptuous one namely that klopstock's remarks on the venerable sage of konigsberg are to my own knowledge injurious and mistaken and so far is it from being true that his system is now given up that throughout the universities of germany there is not a single professor who is not either a kantian or a disciple of fichte whose system is built on the kantian and presupposes its truth or lastly who though an antagonist of kant as to his theoretical work has not embraced wholly or in part his moral system and adopted part of his nomenclature 
Klopstock, having wished to see the Calvary of Cumberland, and asked what was thought of it in England, I went to Remnants, the English bookseller, where I procured the analytical review in which is contained the review of Cumberland's Calvary. I remember to have read there some specimens of a blank verse translation of the Messiah. I had mentioned this to Klopstock, and he had a great desire to see them. I walked over to his house and put the book into his hands. On adverting to his own poem, he told me he began the Messiah when he was seventeen. He devoted three entire years to the plan without composing a single line. He was greatly at a loss in what manner to execute his work. There were no successful specimens of versification in the German language before this time. The first three cantos he wrote in a species of measured or numerous prose. This, though done with much labour and some success, was far from satisfying him. He had composed hexameters both Latin and Greek as a school exercise, and there had been also in the German language attempts in that style of versification. These were only of very moderate merit. One day he was struck with the idea of what could be done in this way. He kept his room a whole day, even went without his dinner, and found that in the evening he had written twenty-three hexameters, versifying a part of what he had before written in prose. From that time, pleased with his efforts, he composed no more in prose. Today he informed me that he had finished his plan before he read Milton. He was enchanted to see an author who before him had trod the same path. This is a contradiction of what he said before. He did not wish to speak of his poem to any one till it was finished, but some of his friends who had seen what he had finished tormented him till he had consented to publish a few books in a journal. He was then, I believe, very young, about twenty-five. The rest was printed at different periods, four books at a time. The reception given to the first specimens was highly flattering, he was nearly thirty years in finishing the whole poem, but of these thirty years not more than two were employed in the composition. He only composed in favourable moments. Besides, he had other occupations. He values himself upon the plan of his odes, and accuses the modern lyrical writers of gross deficiency in this respect. I laid the same accusation against Horace. He would not hear of it, but waived the discussion. He called Rousseau's Ode to Fortune a moral dissertation in stanzas. I spoke of Dryden St. Cecilia, but he did not seem familiar with our writers. He wished to know the distinctions between our dramatic and epic blank verse. He recommended me to read his Hermann before I read either the Messiah or the Odes. He flattered himself that some time or other his dramatic poems would be known in England. He had not heard of Cooper. He thought that Voss, in his translation of the Iliad, had done violence to the idiom of the Germans, and had sacrificed it to the Greeks not remembering sufficiently that each language has its particular spirit and genius. He said Lessing was the first of their dramatic writers. I complained of Nathan as tedious. He said there was not enough of action in it, but that Lessing was the most chaste of their writers. He spoke favourably of Goethe, but said that his Sorrows of Werther was his best work, better than any of his dramas. He preferred the first written to the rest of Goethe's dramas. Schiller's Robbers he found so extravagant that he could not read it. I spoke of the scene of the setting sun. He did not know it. He said Schiller could not live. He thought Don Carlos the best of his dramas, but said that the plot was inextricable. It was evident he knew little of Schiller's works. Indeed, he said, he could not read them. Berger, he said, was a true poet and would live. That Schiller, on the contrary, must soon be forgotten. That he gave himself up to the imitation of Shakespeare, who often was extravagant, but that Schiller was ten thousand times more so. He spoke very slightingly of Kotzebue, as an immoral author in the first place, and next as deficient in power. At Vienna, said he, they are transported with him, but we do not reckon the people of Vienna either the wisest or the wittiest people of Germany. He said Wieland was a charming author and a sovereign master of his own language, that in this respect Goethe could not be compared to him, nor indeed could anybody else. He said that his fault was to be fertile to exuberance. I told him the Oberon had just been translated into English. He asked me if I was not delighted with the poem. I answered that I thought the story began to flag about the seventh or eighth book and observed that it was unworthy of a man of genius to make the interest of a long poem turn entirely upon animal gratification. He seemed at first disposed to excuse us by saying that they are different subjects for poetry, and that poets are not willing to be restricted in their choice. I answered that I thought the passion of love as well suited to the purposes of poetry as any other passion, but that it was a cheap way of pleasing to fix the attention of the reader through a long poem on the mere appetite. Well, but, said he, you see that such poems please everybody. I answered that it was the province of a great poet to raise people up to his own level, not to descend to theirs. He agreed and confessed that on no account whatsoever would he have written a work like the Oberon. He spoke in raptures of Wieland's style, and pointed out the passage where Retzi is delivered of her child as exquisitely beautiful. 
I said that I did not perceive any very striking passages, but that I made allowance for the imperfections of a translation. Of the thefts of Wieland, he said they were so exquisitely managed that the greatest writers might be proud to steal as he did. He considered the books and fables of old romance writers in the light of the ancient mythology as a sort of common property, from which a man was free to take whatever he could make a good use of. An Englishman had presented him with the Odes of Collins, which he had read with pleasure. He knew little or nothing of Gray except his elegy written in a country churchyard. He complained of the fool in Lear, and observed that he seemed to give a terrible wildness to the distress. But still he complained. He asked whether it was not allowed that Pope had written rhyme poetry with more skill than any of our writers. I said I preferred Dryden because his couplets had greater variety in their movement. He thought my reason a good one, but asked whether the rhyme of Pope were not more exact. This question I understood as applying to the final terminations, and observed to him that I believed it was the case, but that I thought it was easy to excuse some inaccuracy in the final sounds, if the general swap of the verse was superior. I told him that we were not so exact with regard to the final endings of the lines as the French. He did not seem to know that we made no distinction between masculine and feminine, i.e. single or double rhymes. At least he put inquiries to me on this subject. He seemed to think that no language could be so far formed as that it might not be enriched by idioms borrowed from another tongue. I said this was a very dangerous practice, and added that I thought Milton had often injured both his prose and verse by taking this liberty too frequently. I recommended to him the prose works of Dryden as models of pure and native English. I was treading upon tender ground, as I have reason to suppose that he has himself liberally indulged the practice. The same day I dined at Mr. Klopstock's, where I had the pleasure of a third interview with the poet. We talked principally about indifferent things. I asked him what he thought of Kant. He said that his reputation was much on the decline in Germany, that for his own part he was not surprised to find it so, as the works of Kant were to him utterly incomprehensible, that he had often been pestered by the Kantians, but was rarely in the practice of arguing with them. His custom was to produce the book, open it and point to a passage, and beg they would explain it. This they ordinarily attempted to do by substituting their own ideas. I do not want, I say, an explanation of your own ideas, but of the passage which is before us. In this way I generally bring the dispute to an immediate conclusion. He spoke of Wolf as the first metaphysician they had in Germany. Wolf had followers, but they could hardly be called a sect, and luckily till the appearance of Kant about fifteen years ago, Germany had not been pestered by any sect of philosophers whatsoever, but that each man had separately pursued his inquiries, uncontrolled by the dogmas of a master. Kant had appeared ambitious to be the founder of a sect, that he had succeeded, but that the Germans were now coming to their senses again, that Nikolai and Engel had in different ways contributed to disenchant the nation, but above all the incomprehensibility of the philosopher and his philosophy. He seemed pleased to hear that as yet Kant's doctrines had not met with many admirers in England, did not doubt but that we had too much wisdom to be duped by a writer who set at defiance the common sense and common understandings of men. We talked of tragedy. He seemed to rate highly the power of exciting tears. I said that nothing was more easy than to deluge an audience, that it was done every day by the meanest writers. I must remind you, my friend, first, that these notes are not intended as specimens of Klopstock's intellectual power, or even colloquial prowess, to judge of which by an accidental conversation, and this with strangers, and those two foreigners, would be not only unreasonable, but calumnious. Secondly, I attribute little other interest to the remarks than what is derived from the celebrity of the person who made them. Lastly, if you ask me whether I have read The Messiah and what I think of it, I answer, as yet the first four books only, and as to my opinion, the reasons of which hereafter, you may guess it from what I could not help muttering to myself when the good pastor this morning told me, that Klopstock was the German Milton, a very German Milton indeed. Heaven preserve you, and S.T. Coleridge. End of letter 3
vel stupidiore sint quam ut satisfactionem intelligent nam quem ad modum simonides dixit thessalos hebetiores esse quam ut possint asse decipi ita quos dam videa stupidiores quam ut placari queant ad haec non mirum est in venire quod calumnieto qui nihil aliud quaerit nisi quod calumnieto erasmus ad dorpium theologum in the refacimento of the friend i have inserted extracts from the consiones ad populum printed though scarcely published in the year seventeen ninety five in the very heat and height of my anti-ministerial enthusiasm these in proof that my principles of politics have sustained no change in the present chapter i have annexed to my letters from germany with particular reference to that which contains a disquisition on the modern drama a critique on the tragedy of bertram written within the last twelve months in proof that i have been as falsely charged with any fickleness in my principles of taste the letter was written to a friend and the apparent abruptness with which it begins is owing to the omission of the introductory sentences you remember my dear sir that mr whitbread shortly before his death proposed to the assembled subscribers of jury lane theatre that the concern should be farmed to some responsible individual under certain conditions and limitations and that his proposal was rejected not without indignation as subversive of the main object for the attainment of which the enlightened and patriotic assemblage of philo dramatists had been induced to risk their subscriptions now this object was avowed to be no less than the redemption of the british stage not only from horses dogs elephants and the like zoological rarities but also from the more pernicious barbarisms and kotzebuisms in morals and taste Drury lane was to be restored to its former classical renown shakespeare johnson and otway with the expurgated muses of ambrew congreve and witcherley were to be reinaugurated in their rightful dominion over british audiences and the herculean process was to commence by exterminating the speaking monsters imported from the banks of the danube compared with which their mute relations the emigrants from exeter change and polito late pidcock's show-cart were tame and inoffensive could an heroic project at once so refined and so arduous be consistently entrusted to could its success be rationally expected from a mercenary manager at whose critical quarantine the lucri bonus odor would conciliate a bill of health to the plague in person no as the work proposed such must be the workmasters rank fortune liberal education and their natural accompaniments or consequences critical discernment delicate tact disinterestedness unsuspected morals notorious patriotism and tried mycenaship these were the recommendations that influenced the votes of the proprietary subscribers of jury lane theatre these the motives that occasioned the election of its supreme committee of management this circumstance alone would have excited a strong interest in the public mind respecting the first production of the tragic muse which had been announced under such auspices and had passed the ordeal of such judgments and the tragedy on which you have requested my judgment was the work on which the great expectations justified by so many causes were doomed at length to settle but before i enter on the examination of bertram or the castle of st aldobrand i shall interpose a few words on the phrase german drama which i hold to be altogether a misnomer at the time of lessing the german stage such as it was appears to have been a flat and servile copy of the french it was lessing who first introduced the name and the works of shakespeare to the admiration of the germans and i should not perhaps go too far if i add that it was lessing who first proved to all thinking men even to shakespeare's own countrymen the true nature of his apparent irregularities these he demonstrated were deviations only from the accidents of the greek tragedy and from such accidents as hung a heavy weight on the wings of the greek poets and narrowed their flight within the limits of what we may call the heroic opera he proved that in all the essentials of art no less than in the truth of nature the plays of shakespeare were incomparably more coincident with the principles of aristotle than the productions of corneille and racine notwithstanding the boasted regularity of the latter under these convictions were lessing's own dramatic works composed their deficiency is in depth and imagination their excellence is in the construction of the plot the good sense of the sentiments the sobriety of the morals and the high polish of the diction and dialogue in short his dramas are the very antipodes of all those which it has been the fashion of late years at once to abuse and enjoy under the name of the german drama of this latter schiller's robbers was the earliest specimen the first fruits of his youth i had almost said of his boyhood and as such the pledge and promise of no ordinary genius only as such did the maturer judgment of the author tolerate the play during his whole life he expressed himself concerning this production with more than needful asperity 
as a monster not less offensive to good taste than to sound morals and in his latter years his indignation at the unwonted popularity of the robbers seduced him into the contrary extremes viz a studied feebleness of interest as far as the interest was to be derived from incidents and the excitement of curiosity a diction elaborately metrical the affectation of rhymes and the pedantry of the chorus but to understand the true character of the robbers and of the countless imitations which were its spawn i must inform you or at least call to your recollection that about that time and for some years before it three of the most popular books in the german language were the translations of young's night thoughts harvey's meditations and richardson's clarissa harlow now we have only to combine the bloated style and peculiar rhythm of harvey which is poetic only on account of its utter unfitness for prose and might as appropriately be called prosaic from its utter unfitness for poetry we have only i repeat to combine these harveyisms with the strained thoughts the figurative metaphysics and solemn epigrams of young on the one hand and with the loaded sensibility the minute detail the morbid consciousness of every thought and feeling in the whole flux and reflux of the mind in short the self-involution and dream-like continuity of richardson on the other hand and then to add the horrific incidents and mysterious villains geniuses of supernatural intellect if you will take the author's words for it but on a level with the meanest ruffians of the condemned cells if we are to judge by their actions and contrivances to add the ruined castles the dungeons the trap-doors the skeletons the flesh-and-blood ghosts and the perpetual moonshine of a modern author themselves the literary brood of the castle of otranto the translations of which with the imitations and improvements aforesaid were about that time beginning to make as much noise in germany as their originals were making in england and as the compound of these ingredients duly mixed you will recognise the so-called german drama the olla podrida thus cooked up was denounced by the best critics in germany as the mere cramps of weakness and orgasms of a sickly imagination on the part of the author and the lowest provocation of torpid feeling on that of the readers the old blunder however concerning the irregularity and wildness of shakespeare in which the german did but echo the french who again were but the echoes of our own critics was still in vogue and shakespeare was quoted as authority for the most anti-shakespearean drama we have indeed two poets who wrote as one near the age of shakespeare to whom as the worst characteristic of their writings the coryphaeus of the present drama may challenge the honour of being a poor relation or impoverished descendant for if we would charitably consent to forget the comic humour the wit the felicities of style in other words all the poetry and nine-tenths of all the genius of beaumont and fletcher that which would remain becomes a kotzebue the so-called german drama therefore is english in its origin english in its materials and english by readoption until we can prove that kotzebue or any of the whole breed of kotzebues whether dramatists or romantic writers or writers of romantic dramas were ever admitted to any other shelf in the libraries of well-educated germans than were occupied by their originals and apes apes in their mother country we should submit to carry our own brat on our own shoulders or rather consider it as a lack grace returned from transportation with such improvements only in growth and manners as young transported convicts usually come home with i know nothing that contributes more to a clearer insight into the true nature of any literary phenomenon than the comparison of it with some elder production the likeness of which is striking yet only apparent while the difference is real in the present case this opportunity is furnished us by the old spanish play entitled atheista fulminato formerly and perhaps still acted in the churches and monasteries of spain and which under various names don juan the libertine etc has had its day of favour in every country throughout europe a popularity so extensive and of a work so grotesque and extravagant claims and merits philosophical attention and investigation the first point to be noticed is that the play is throughout imaginative nothing of it belongs to the real world but the names of the places and persons the comic parts equally with the tragic the living equally with the defunct characters are creatures of the brain as little amenable to the rules of ordinary probability as the satan of paradise lost or the caliban of the tempest and therefore to be understood and judged of as impersonated abstractions rank fortune wit talent acquired knowledge and liberal accomplishments with beauty of person vigorous health and constitutional hardihood all these advantages elevated by the habits and sympathies of noble birth and national character are supposed to have combined in don juan so as to give him the means of carrying into all its practical consequences the doctrine of a godless nature as the sole ground and efficient cause not only of all things events and appearances but likewise of all our thoughts sensations impulses and actions obedience to nature is the only virtue the gratification of the passions and appetites her only dictate each individual self-will the sole organ through which nature utters her commands and 
self-contradiction is the only wrong for by the laws of spirit in the right is every individual character that acts in strict consistence with itself that speculative opinions however impious and daring they may be are not always followed by correspondent conduct is most true as well as that they can scarcely in any instance be systematically realized on account of their unsuitableness to human nature and to the institutions of society it can be hell only where it is all hell and a separate world of devils is necessary for the existence of any one complete devil but on the other hand it is no less clear nor with the biography of carrier and his fellow atheists before us can it be denied without wilful blindness that the so-called system of nature that is materialism with the utter rejection of moral responsibility of a present providence and of both present and future retribution may influence the characters and actions of individuals and even of communities to a degree that almost does away the distinction between men and devils and will make the page of the future historian resemble the narration of a madman's dreams it is not the wickedness of don juan therefore which constitutes the character an abstraction and removes it from the rules of probability but the rapid succession of the correspondent acts and incidents his intellectual superiority and the splendid accumulation of his gifts and desirable qualities as coexistent with entire wickedness in one and the same person but this likewise is the very circumstance which gives to this strange play its charm and universal interest don juan is from beginning to end an intelligible character as much so as the satan of milton the poet asks only of the reader what as a poet he is privileged to ask namely that sort of negative faith in the existence of such a being which we willingly give to productions professedly ideal and a disposition to the same state of feeling as that with which we contemplate the idealized figures of the apollo belvedere and the farnese hercules what the hercules is to the eye in corporeal strength don juan is to the mind in strength of character the ideal consists in the happy balance of the generic with the individual the former makes the character representative and symbolical therefore instructive because mutatis mutandis it is applicable to whole classes of men the latter gives it living interest for nothing lives or is real but as definite and individual to understand this completely the reader need only recollect the specific state of his feelings when in looking at a picture of the historic more properly of the poetic or heroic class he objects to a particular figure as being too much of a portrait and this interruption of his complacency he feels without the least reference to or the least acquaintance with any person in real life whom he might recognize in this figure it is enough that such a figure is not ideal and therefore not ideal because one of the two factors or elements of the ideal is in excess a similar and more powerful objection he would feel towards a set of figures which were mere abstractions like those of cipriani and what have been called greek forms and faces that is outlines drawn according to a recipe these again are not ideal because in these the other element is in excess forma formans per formam formatam translucens is the definition and perfection of ideal art this excellence is so happily achieved in the don juan that it is capable of interesting without poetry nay even without words as in our pantomime of that name we see clearly how the character is formed and the very extravagance of the incidents and the superhuman entireness of don juan's agency prevents the wickedness from shocking our minds to any painful degree we do not believe it enough for this effect no not even with that kind of temporary and negative belief or acquiescence which i have described above meantime the qualities of his character are too desirable too flattering to our pride and our wishes not to make up on this side as much additional faith as was lost on the other there is no danger thinks the spectator or reader of my becoming such a monster of iniquity as don juan i never shall be an atheist i shall never disallow all distinction between right and wrong i have not the least inclination to be so outrageous a jocanseer in my love affairs but to possess such a power of captivating and enchanting the affections of the other sex to be capable of inspiring in a charming and even a virtuous woman a love so deep and so entirely personal to me that even my worst vices if i were vicious even my cruelty and perfidy if i were cruel and perfidious could not eradicate the passion to be so loved for my own self that even with a distinct knowledge of my character she had died to save me this sir takes hold of two sides of our nature the better and the worse for the heroic disinterestedness to which love can transport a woman cannot be contemplated without an honourable emotion of reverence towards womanhood and on the other hand it is among the miseries and abides in the dark groundwork of our nature to crave an outward confirmation of that something within us which is our very self that something not made up of our qualities and relations but itself the supporter and substantial basis of all these 
love me and not my qualities may be a vicious and an insane wish but it is not a wish wholly without a meaning without power virtue would be insufficient and incapable of revealing its being it would resemble the magic transformation of tasso's heroine into a tree in which she could only groan and bleed hence power is necessarily an object of our desire and of our admiration but of all power that of the mind is on every account the grand desideratum of human ambition we shall be as gods in knowledge was and must have been the first temptation and the coexistence of great intellectual lordship with guilt has never been adequately represented without exciting the strongest interest and for this reason that in this bad and heterogeneous coordination we can contemplate the intellect of man more exclusively as a separate self-subsistence than in its proper state of subordination to his own conscience or to the will of an infinitely superior being this is the sacred charm of shakespeare's male characters in general they are all cast in the mould of shakespeare's own gigantic intellect and this is the open attraction of his richard iago edmund and others in particular but again of all intellectual power that of superiority to the fear of the invisible world is the most dazzling its influence is abundantly proved by the one circumstance that it can bribe us into a voluntary submission of our better knowledge into suspension of all our judgment derived from constant experience and enable us to peruse with the liveliest interest the wildest tales of ghosts wizards genii and secret talismans on this propensity so deeply rooted in our nature a specific dramatic probability may be raised by a true poet if the whole of his work be in harmony a dramatic probability sufficient for dramatic pleasure even when the component characters and incidents border on impossibility the poet does not require us to be awake and believe he solicits us only to yield ourselves to a dream and this too with our eyes open and with our judgment perdu behind the curtain ready to awaken us at the first motion of our will and meantime only not to disbelieve and in such a state of mind who but must be impressed with the cool intrepidity of don john on the appearance of his father's ghost ghost monster behold these wounds don john i do they were well meant and well performed i see ghost repent repent of all thy villainies my clamorous blood to heaven for vengeance cries heaven will pour out his judgments on you all hell gapes for you for you each fiend doth call and hourly waits your unrepenting fall you with eternal horrors they'll torment except of all your crimes you suddenly repent ghost sinks don john farewell thou art a foolish ghost repent quoth he what could this mean our senses are all in a mist sure don antonio one of don john's reprobate companions they are not twas a ghost don lopez another reprobate i ne'er believed those foolish tales before don john come tis no matter let it be what it will it must be natural don antonio our nature is unalterable in us too don john tis true the nature of a ghost cannot change ours who also can deny a portion of sublimity to the tremendous consistency with which he stands out the last fearful trial like a second prometheus chorus of devils statue ghost will you not relent and feel remorse don john couldst thou bestow another heart on me i might but with this heart i have i cannot don lopez these things are prodigious don antonio i have a sort of grudging to relent but something holds me back don lopez if we could tis now too late i will not don antonio we defy thee ghost perish ye impious wretches go and find the punishments laid up in store for you thunder and lightning don lopez and don antonio are swallowed up ghost to don john behold they are dreadful fates and know that thy last moments come don john think not to fright me foolish ghost i'll break your marble body in pieces and pull down your horse thunder and lightning chorus of devils etc don john these things i see with wonder but no fear were all the elements to be confounded and shuffled all into their former chaos were seas of sulphur flaming round about me and all mankind roaring within those fires i could not fear or feel the least remorse to the last instant i would dare thy power here i stand firm and all thy threats contemn thy murderer to the ghost of one whom he had murdered stands here now do thy worst he is swallowed up in a cloud of fire in fine the character of don john consists in the union of everything desirable to human nature as means and which therefore by the well-known law of association becomes at length desirable on their own account on their own account and in their own dignity they are here displayed 
as being employed to ends so unhuman that in the effect they appear almost as means without an end the ingredients too are mixed in the happiest proportion so as to uphold and relieve each other more especially in that constant interpoise of wit gaiety and social generosity which prevents the criminal even in his most atrocious moments from sinking into the mere ruffian as far at least as our imagination sits in judgment above all the fine suffusion through the whole with the characteristic manners and feelings of a highly bred gentleman gives life to the drama thus having invited the statue ghost of the governor whom he had murdered to supper which invitation the marble ghost accepted by a nod of the head don john has prepared a banquet don john some wine sirrah here's to don pedro's ghost he should have been welcome on lopez the rascal is afraid of you after death one knocks hard at the door don john to the servant rise and do your duty servant oh the devil the devil marble ghost enters don john ha tis the ghost let's rise and receive him come governor you are welcome sit there if we had thought you would have come we would have stayed for you here governor your health friends put it about here's excellent meat taste of this ragout come i'll help you come eat and let old quarrels be forgotten the ghost threatens him with vengeance don john we are too much confirmed curse on this dry discourse come here's to your mistress you had one when you were living not forgetting your sweet sister devil centre don john are these some of your retinue devil say you i am sorry i have no burnt brandy to treat em with that's drink fit for devils etc nor is the scene from which we quote interesting in dramatic probability alone it is susceptible likewise of a sound moral of a moral that has more than common claims on the notice of a too numerous class who are ready to receive the qualities of gentlemanly courage and scrupulous honour in all the recognised laws of honour as the substitutes of virtue instead of its ornaments this indeed is the moral value of the play at large and that which places it at a world's distance from the spirit of modern jacobinism the latter introduces to us clumsy copies of these showy instrumental qualities in order to reconcile us to vice and want of principle while the atheist of fulminato presents an exquisite portraiture of the same qualities in all their gloss and glow but presents them for the sole purpose of displaying their hollowness and in order to put us on our guard by demonstrating their utter indifference to vice and virtue whenever these and the like accomplishments are contemplated for themselves alone eighteen years ago i observed that the whole secret of the modern jacobinical drama which and not the german is its appropriate designation and of all its popularity consists in the confusion and subversion of the natural order of things in their causes and effects namely in the excitement of surprise by representing the qualities of liberality refined feeling and a nice sense of honour those things rather which pass amongst us for such in persons and in classes where experience teaches us least to expect them and by rewarding with all the sympathies which are the due of virtue those criminals whom law reason and religion have excommunicated from our esteem this of itself would lead me back to bertram or the castle of st aldobrand but in my own mind this tragedy was brought into connection with the libertine shadwell's adaptation of the atheist of fulminato to the english stage in the reign of charles the second by the fact that our modern drama is taken in the substance of it from the first scene of the third act of the libertine but with what palpable superiority of judgment in the original earth and hell men and spirits are up in arms against don john the two former acts of the play have not only prepared us for the supernatural but accustomed us to the prodigious it is therefore neither more nor less than we anticipate when the captain exclaims in all the dangers i have been such horrors i never knew i am quite unmanned and when the hermit says that he had beheld the ocean in wildest rage yet ne'er before saw a storm so dreadful such horrid flashes of lightning and such claps of thunder were never in my remembrance and don john's burst of startling impiety is equally intelligible in its motive as dramatic in its effect but what is there to account for the prodigy of the tempest at bertram's shipwreck it is a mere supernatural effect without even a hint of any supernatural agency a prodigy without any circumstance mentioned that is prodigious and a miracle introduced without a ground and ending without a result every event in every scene of the play might have taken place as well if bertram and his vessel had been driven in by a common hard gale or from want of provisions the first act would have indeed lost its greatest and most sonorous picture a scene for the sake of a scene without a word spoken as such therefore a rarity without a precedent we must take it and be thankful in the opinion of not a few it was in every sense of the word the best scene in the play i am quite certain it was the most innocent and the steady quiet uprightness of the flame of the wax candles 
which the monks held over the roaring billows amid the storm of wind and rain, was really miraculous. The Sicilian sea-coast, a convent of monks, night, a most portentous unearthly storm, a vessel is wrecked contrary to all human expectation, one man saves himself by his prodigious powers as a swimmer, aided by the peculiarity of his destination. Prior. All, all did perish. First monk. Change, change those drenched weeds. Prior. I wist not of them. Every soul did perish. Enter third monk hastily. Third monk. No, there was one did battle with the storm with callous desperate force. Full many times his life was won and lost, as though he wrecked not. No hand did aid him, and he aided none. Alone he breasted the broad wave. Alone that man was saved. Well, this man is led in by the monks, supposed dripping wet, and to very natural inquiries he either remains silent, or gives most brief and surly answers, and after three or four of these half-line courtesies, dashing off the monks who had saved him, he exclaims in the true sublimity of our modern misanthropic heroism, Off! Ye are men, there's poison in your touch, but I must yield for this, what, hath left me strengthless. So end the three first scenes. In the next, the castle of St. Aldebrand, we find the servants there equally frightened with this unearthly storm, though wherein it differed from other violent storms we are not told, except that Hugo informs us, page 9. Pietro. Hugo well met. Does e'en thy age bear memory of so terrible a storm? Hugo. They have been frequent lately. Pietro. They are ever so in Sicily. Hugo. So it is said. But storms when I was young would still pass o'er like nature's fitful fevers, and rendered all more wholesome. Now their rage, sent thus unseasonable and profitless, speaks like the threats of heaven. A most perplexing theory of Sicilian storms is this of old Hugo, and what is very remarkable, not apparently founded on any great familiarity of his own with this troublesome article. For when Pietro asserts the ever more frequency of tempests in Sicily, the old man professes to know nothing more of the fact, but by hearsay. So it is said. But why he assumed this storm to be unseasonable, and on what he grounded his prophecy, for the storm is still in full fury, that it would be profitless, and without the physical powers common to all other violent sea-winds in purifying the atmosphere, we are left in the dark, as well concerning the particular points in which he knew it, during its continuance, to differ from those that he had been acquainted with in his youth. We are at length introduced to the lady Imogen, who, we learn, had not rested through the night, not on account of the tempest, for long ere the storm arose her restless gestures forbade all hope to see her blessed with sleep sitting at a table and looking at a portrait she informs us first that portrait painters may make a portrait from memory the limner's art may trace the absent feature for well, surely these words could never mean that a painter may have a person sit to him who afterwards may leave the room or perhaps the country secondly that a portrait painter can enable a mourning lady to possess a good likeness of her absent lover but that the portrait painter cannot and who shall restore the scenes in which they met and parted the natural answer would have been why the scene painter to be sure but this unreasonable lady requires in addition sundry things to be painted that have neither lines nor colours the thoughts the recollections sweet and bitter or the elysian dreams of lovers when they loved which last sentence must be supposed to mean when they were present and making love to each other then if this portrait could speak it would acquit the faith of womankind how has she remained constant no she has been married to another man whose wife she now is how then why that in spite of her marriage vow she had continued to yearn and crave for her former lover this has her body that her mind which has the better bargain the lover however was not contented with this precious arrangement as we shall soon find the lady proceeds to inform us that during the many years of their separation there have happened in the different parts of the world a number of such things even such as in a course of years always have and till the millennium doubtless always will happen somewhere or other yet this passage both in language and in metre is perhaps amongst the best parts of the play the lady's love companion and most esteemed attendant clotilda now enters and explains this love and esteem by proving herself a most passive and dispassionate listener as well as a brief and lucky querist who asks by chance questions that we should have thought made for the very sake of the answers in short she very much reminds us of those puppet heroines for whom the showman contrives to dialogue without any skill in ventriloquism this notwithstanding is the best scene in the play and though crowded with solecisms corrupt diction and offences against metre would possess merit sufficient to outweigh them if we could suspend the moral sense during the perusal it tells well and passionately the preliminary circumstances and thus overcomes the main difficulty of most first acts to wit that of retrospective narration 
it tells us of her having been honourably addressed by a noble youth of rank and fortune vastly superior to her own of their mutual love heightened on her part by gratitude of his loss of his sovereign's favour his disgrace attainder and flight that he thus degraded sank into a vile ruffian the chieftain of a murderous banditti and that from the habitual indulgence of the most reprobate habits and ferocious passions he had become so changed even in appearance and features that she who bore him had recoiled from him nor known the alien visage of her child yet still she imogen loved him she is compelled by the silent entreaties of her father perishing with bitter shameful want on the cold earth to give her hand with a heart thus irrecoverably pre-engaged to lord aldebrand the enemy of her lover even to the very man who had baffled his ambitious schemes and was at the present time entrusted with the execution of the sentence of death which had been passed on bertram now the proof of woman's love so industriously held forth for the sympathy if not for the esteem of the audience consists in this that though bertram had become a robber and a murderer by trade a ruffian in manners yea with form and features at which his own mother could not but recoil yet she lady imogen the wife of a most noble honoured lord estimable as a man exemplary and affectionate as a husband and the fond father of her only child but she notwithstanding all this striking her heart dares to say to it but thou art bertram still and bertram's ever a monk now enters and entreats in his prior's name for the wonted hospitality and free noble usage of the castle of st aldobrand for some wretched shipwrecked souls and from this we learn for the first time to our infinite surprise that notwithstanding the supernaturalness of the storm aforesaid not only bertram but the whole of his gang had been saved by what means we are left to conjecture and can only conclude that they had all the same desperate swimming powers and the same saving destiny as the hero bertram himself so ends the first act and with it the tale of the events both those with which the tragedy begins and those which had occurred previous to the date of its commencement the second displays bertram in disturbed sleep which the prior who hangs over him prefers calling a starting trance and with a strained voice that would have awakened one of the seven sleepers observes to the audience how the lip works how the bare teeth do grind and beaded drops course down his writhen brow the dramatic effect of which passage we not only concede to the admirers of this tragedy but acknowledge the further advantages of preparing the audience for the most surprising series of wry faces proflated mouths and lunatic gestures that were ever launched on an audience to sear the sense prior i will awake him from this horrid trance this is no natural sleep ho wake thee stranger this is rather a whimsical application of the verb reflex we must confess though we remember a similar transfer of the agent to the patient in a manuscript tragedy in which the bertram of the piece prostrating a man with a single blow of his fist exclaims knock me thee down then ask thee if thou livest well the stranger obeys and whatever his sleep might have been his waking was perfectly natural for the lethargy itself could not withstand the scolding stentorship of mr holland the prior we next learn from the best authority his own confession that the misanthropic hero whose destiny was incompatible with drowning is count bertram who not only reveals his past fortunes but avows with open atrocity his satanic hatred of imogen's lord and his frantic thirst of revenge and so the raving character raves and the scolding character scolds and what else does not the prior act does he not send for a posse of constables or thief-takers to handcuff the villain or take him either to bedlam or newgate nothing of the kind the author preserves the unity of character and the scolding prior from first to last does nothing but scold with the exception indeed of the last scene of the last act in which with a most surprising revolution he whines weeps and kneels to the condemned blaspheming assassin out of pure affection to the high-hearted man the sublimity of whose angel sin rivals the star-bright apostate that is who was as proud as lucifer and as wicked as the devil and had thrilled him prior holland aforesaid with wild admiration accordingly in the very next scene we have this tragic macheath with his whole gang in the castle of st aldobrand without any attempt on the prior's part either to prevent him or to put the mistress and servants of the castle on their guard against their new inmates though he the prior knew and confesses that he knew that bertram's fearful mates were assassins so habituated and naturalized to guilt that when their drenched hold forsook both gold and gear they gripped their daggers with a murderous instinct and though he also knew that bertram was the leader of a band whose trade was blood to the castle however he goes thus with the holy prior's consent if not with his assistance and thither let us follow him 
no sooner is our hero safely housed in the castle of st aldebrand than he attracts the notice of the lady and her confidant by his wild and terrible dark eyes muffled form fearful form darkly wild proudly stern and the like commonplace indefinites seasoned by merely verbal antitheses and at best copied with very slight change from the conrad of southey's joan of arc the lady imogen who has been as is the case she tells us with all soft and solemn spirits worshipping the moon on a terrace or rampart within view of the castle insists on having an interview with our hero and this too tete-a-tete -tete. would the reader learn why and wherefore the confidant is excluded who very properly remonstrates against such conference alone at night with one who bears such fearful form the reason follows why therefore send him i say follows because the next line all things of fear have lost their power over me is separated from the former by a break or pause and besides that it is a very poor answer to the danger is no answer at all to the gross indelicacy of this wilful exposure we must therefore regard it as a mere afterthought that a little softens the rudeness but adds nothing to the weight of that exquisite woman's reason aforesaid and so exit clotilda and enter bertram who stands without looking at her that is with his lower limbs forked his arms akimbo his side to the lady's front the whole figure resembling an inverted y he is soon however roused from the state surly to the state frantic and then follow raving yelling cursing she fainting he relenting in runs imogen's child squeaks mother he snatches it up and with a god bless thee child bertram has kissed thy child the curtain drops the third act is short and short be our account of it it introduces lord st aldebrand on his road homeward and next imogen in the convent confessing the foulness of her heart to the prior who first indulges his old humour with a fit of senseless scolding then leaves her alone with a ruffian paramour with whom she makes at once an infamous appointment and the curtain drops that it may be carried into act and consummation i want words to describe the mingled horror and disgust with which i witnessed the opening of the fourth act considering it as a melancholy proof of the depravation of the public mind the shocking spirit of jacobinism seemed no longer confined to politics the familiarity with atrocious events and characters appeared to have poisoned the taste even where it had not directly disorganized the moral principles and left the feelings callous to all the mild appeals and craving alone for the grossest and most outrageous stimulants the very fact then present to our senses that a british audience could remain passive under such an insult to common decency nay receive with a thunder of applause a human being supposed to have come reeking from the consummation of this complex foulness and baseness these and the like reflections so pressed as with the weight of lead upon my heart that actor author and tragedy would have been forgotten had it not been for a plain elderly man sitting beside me who with a very serious face that at once expressed surprise and aversion touched my elbow and pointing to the actor said to me in a half whisper do you see that little fellow there he's just been committing adultery somewhat relieved by the laugh which this droll address occasioned i forced back my attention to the stage sufficiently to learn that bertram is recovered from a transient fit of remorse by the information that st aldebrand was commissioned to do what every honest man must have done without commission if he did his duty to seize him and deliver him to the just vengeance of the law an information which as he had long known himself to be an attainted traitor and proclaimed outlaw and not only a trader in blood himself but notoriously the captain of a gang of thieves pirates and assassins assuredly could not have been new to him it is this however which alone and instantly restores him to his accustomed state of raving blasphemy and nonsense next follows imogen's constrained interview with her injured husband and his sudden departure again all in love and kindness in order to attend the feast of st anselm at the convent this was it must be owned a very strange engagement for so tender a husband to make within a few minutes after so long an absence but first his lady has told him that she has a vow on her and wishes that black perdition may gulf her perjured soul no she is lying at the very time if she ascends his bed till her penance is accomplished how therefore is the poor husband to amuse himself in this interval of her penance but do not be distressed reader on account of the st aldebrand's absence as the author has contrived to send him out of the house when a husband would be in his and the lover's way so he will doubtless not be at a loss to bring him back again as soon as he is wanted well the husband gone in on the one side out pops the lover from the other and for the fiendish purpose of harrowing up the soul of his wretched accomplice in guilt by announcing to her with most brutal and blasphemous execrations his fixed and deliberate resolve to assassinate her husband 
all this too is for no discoverable purpose on the part of the author but that of introducing a series of super-tragic starts pauses screams struggling dagger-throwing falling on the ground starting up again wildly swearing outcries for help falling again on the ground rising again faintly tottering towards the door and to end the scene a most convenient fainting fit of our ladies just in time to give bertram an opportunity of seeking the object of his hatred before she alarms the house which indeed she has had full time to have done before but that the author rather chose she should amuse herself and the audience by the above described ravings and startings she recovers slowly and to her enter clotilda the confidant and mother confessor then commences what in theatrical language is called the madness but which the author more accurately entitles delirium it appearing indeed a sort of intermittent fever with fits of light-headedness off and on whenever occasion and stage effect happen to call for it a convenient return of the storm we told the reader beforehand how it would be had changed the rivulet that bathed the convent walls into a foaming flood upon its brink the lord and his small train do stand appalled with torch and bell from their high battlements the monks do summon to the pass in vain he must return to-night talk of the devil and his horns appear says the proverb and sure enough within ten lines of the exit of the messenger sent to stop him the arrival of lord st aldebrand is announced bertram's ruffian band now enter and range themselves across the stage giving fresh cause for imogen's screams and madness st aldebrand having received his mortal wound behind the scenes tosses in to welter in his blood and to die at the feet of this double damned adulteress of her as far as she is concerned in this fourth act we have two additional points to notice first the low cunning and jesuitical trick with which she deludes her husband into words of forgiveness which he himself does not understand and secondly that everywhere she is made the object of interest and sympathy and it is not the author's fault if at any moment she excites feelings less gentle than those we are accustomed to associate with the self-accusations of a sincere religious penitent and did a british audience endure all this they received it with plaudits which but for the rivalry of the carts and hackney coaches might have disturbed the evening prayers of the scanty week-day congregation at st paul's cathedral tempora mutanto nos et mutamo in illis of the fifth act the only thing noticeable for rant and nonsense though abundant as ever have long before the last act become things of course is the profane representation of the high altar in a chapel with all the vessels and other preparations for the holy sacrament a hymn is actually sung on the stage by the chorister boys for the rest imogen who now and then talks deliriously but who is always light-headed as far as her gown and hair can make her so wanders about in dark woods with cavern rocks and precipices in the back scene and a number of mute dramatis personae move in and out continually for whose presence there is always at least this reason that they afford something to be seen by that very large part of a dreary lane audience who have small chance of hearing a word she had it appears taken her child with her but what becomes of the child whether she murdered it or not nobody can tell nobody can learn it was a riddle at the representation and after a most attentive perusal of the play a riddle it remains no more i know i wish i did and i would tell it all to you for what became of this poor child there's none that ever knew our whole information is derived from the following words prior where is thy child clotilde pointing to the cavern into which she has looked oh he lies cold within his cavern tomb why dost thou urge her with the horrid theme prior who will not the reader may observe be disappointed of his dose of scolding it was to make query wake one living cord o the heart and i will try though my own breaks at it where is thy child imogen with a frantic laugh the forest fiend hath snatched him he who the fiend or the child rides the nightmare through the wizard woods now these two lines consist in a senseless plagiarism from the counterfeited madness of edgar in lear who in imitation of the gipsy incantations puns on the old word mare a hag and the no less senseless adoption of dryden's forest fiend and the wizard stream by which milton in his lycidas so finely characterizes the spreading diva fabulosus amnis observe too these images stand unique in the speeches of imogen without the slightest resemblance to anything she says before or after but we are weary the characters in this act frisk about here there and everywhere as teasingly as the jack-o'-lantern lights which mischievous boys from across a narrow street throw with a looking-glass on the faces of their opposite neighbours bertram disarmed out heroding charles de moor in the robbers befaces the collected knights of st anselm all in complete armour and so by pure dint of black looks he outdares them into passive poltroons 
the sudden revolution in the prior's manners we have before noticed and it is indeed so outre that a number of the audience imagined a great secret was to come out viz that the prior was one of the many instances of a youthful sinner metamorphosed into an old scold and that this bertram would appear at last to be his son imogen reappears at the convent and dies of her own accord bertram stabs himself and dies by her side and that the play may conclude as it began to wit in a superfetation of blasphemy upon nonsense because he had snatched a sword from a despicable coward who retreats in terror when it is pointed towards him in sport this fellow de say and thief captain this loathsome and leprous confluence of robbery adultery murder and cowardly assassination this monster whose best deed is the having saved his betters from the degradation of hanging him by turning jack ketch to himself first recommends the charitable monks and holy prior to pray for his soul and then has the folly and impudence to exclaim i die no felon's death a warrior's weapon freed a warrior's soul End of chapter twenty three Chapter twenty four of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter twenty four. Conclusion. It sometimes happens that we are punished for our faults by incidents, in the causation of which these faults had no share, and this I have always felt the severest punishment the wound indeed is of the same dimensions but the edges are jagged and there is a dull underpain that survives the smart which it had aggravated for there is always a consolatory feeling that accompanies the sense of a proportion between antecedents and consequence and the sense of before and after becomes both intelligible and intellectual when and only when we contemplate the succession in the relations of cause and effect which like the two poles of the magnet manifest the being and unity of the one power by relative opposites and give as it were a substratum of permanence of identity and therefore of reality to the shadowy flux of time it is eternity revealing itself in the phenomena of time and the perception and acknowledgment of the proportionality and appropriateness of the present to the past prove to the afflicted soul that it has not yet been deprived of the sight of god that it can still recognise the effective presence of a father though through a darkened glass and a turbid atmosphere though of a father that is chastising it and for this cause doubtless are we so framed in mind and even so organised in brain and nerve that all confusion is painful it is within the experience of many medical practitioners that a patient with strange and unusual symptoms of disease has been more distressed in mind more wretched from the fact of being unintelligible to himself and others than from the pain or danger of the disease nay that the patient has received the most solid comfort and resumed a genial and enduring cheerfulness from some new symptom or product that had at once determined the name and nature of his complaint and rendered it an intelligible effect of an intelligible cause even though the discovery did at the same moment preclude all hope of restoration hence the mystic theologians whose delusions we may more confidently hope to separate from their actual intuitions when we condescend to read their works without the presumption that whatever our fancy always the ape and too often the adulterator and counterfeit of our memory has not made or cannot make a picture of must be nonsense hence i say the mystics have joined in representing the state of the reprobate spirits as a dreadful dream in which there is no sense of reality not even of the pangs they are enduring an eternity without time and as it were below it god present without manifestation of his presence but these are depths which we dare not linger over let us turn to an instance more on a level with the ordinary sympathies of mankind here then and in this same healing influence of light and distinct beholding we may detect the final cause of that instinct which in the great majority of instances leads and almost compels the afflicted to communicate their sorrows hence too flows the alleviation that results from opening out our griefs which are thus presented in distinguishable forms instead of the mist through which whatever is shapeless becomes magnified and literally enormous casimir in the fifth ode of his third book has happily expressed this thought me longa silendi edit amor facilesque luctus hausit medulas fugerit ocius simul negantem vis regiusuris ares amicorum et loquasem questibus evacuaris iram olim curendo destinimus queri ipsoque fletu lacrima perditur 
nec fortis aeque si per omnes cura volat residet que ramos vires amices perdit in aribus minorque semper dividitur dolor per multa permissus vagari pectora i shall not make this an excuse however for troubling my readers with any complaints or explanations with which as readers they have little or no concern it may suffice for the present at least to declare that the causes that have delayed the publication of these volumes for so long a period after they had been printed off were not connected with any neglect of my own and that they would form an instructive comment on the character concerning authorship as a trade addressed to young men of genius in the first volume of this work i remember the ludicrous effect produced on my mind by the fast sentence of an autobiography which happily for the writer was as meagre in instance as it is well possible for the life of an individual to be the eventful life which i am about to record from the hour in which i rose into existence on this planet etc yet when notwithstanding this warning example of importance before me i review my own life i cannot refrain from applying the same epithet to it and with more than ordinary emphasis and no private feeling that affected myself only should prevent me from publishing the same for write it i assuredly shall should life and leisure be granted me if continued reflection should strengthen my present belief that my history would add its contingent to the enforcement of one important truth to wit that we must not only love our neighbours as ourselves but ourselves likewise as our neighbours and that we can do neither unless we love god above both who lives that's not depraved or depraves who dies that bears not one spurn to the grave of their friend's gift strange as the delusion may appear yet it is most true that three years ago i did not know or believe that i had an enemy in the world and now even my strongest sensations of gratitude are mingled with fear and i reproach myself for being too often disposed to ask have i one friend during the many years which intervened between the composition and the publication of the christabel it became almost as well known among literary men as if it had been on common sale the same references were made to it and the same liberties taken with it even to the very names of the imaginary persons in the poem from almost all of our most celebrated poets and from some with whom i had no personal acquaintance i either received or heard of expressions of admiration that i can truly say appeared to myself utterly disproportionate to a work that pretended to be nothing more than a common fairy tale many who had allowed no merit to my other poems whether printed or manuscript and who have frankly told me as much uniformly made an exception in favour of the christabel and the poem entitled love year after year and in societies of the most different kinds i had been entreated to recite it and the result was still the same in all and altogether different in this respect from the effect produced by the occasional recitation of any other poems i had composed this before the publication and since then with very few exceptions i have heard nothing but abuse and this too in a spirit of bitterness at least as disproportionate to the pretensions of the poem had it been the most pitiably below mediocrity as the previous eulogies and far more inexplicable this may serve as a warning to authors that in their calculations on the probable reception of a poem they must subtract to a large amount from the panegyric which may have encouraged them to publish it however unsuspicious and however various the sources of this panegyric may have been and first allowances must be made for private enmity of the very existence of which they had perhaps entertained no suspicion for personal enmity behind the mask of anonymous criticism secondly for the necessity of a certain proportion of abuse and ridicule in a review in order to make it saleable in consequence of which if they have no friends behind the scenes the chance must needs be against them but lastly and chiefly for the excitement and temporary sympathy of feeling which the recitation of the poem by an admirer especially if he be at once a warm admirer and a man of acknowledged celebrity calls forth in the audience for this is really a species of animal magnetism in which the enkindling reciter by perpetual comment of looks and tones lends his own will and apprehensive faculty to his auditors they live for the time within the dilated sphere of his intellectual being it is equally possible though not equally common that a reader left to himself should sink below the poem as that the poem left to itself should flag beneath the feelings of the reader but in my own instance i had the additional misfortune of having been gossiped about as devoted to metaphysics and worse than all to a system incomparably nearer to the visionary flights of plato and even to the jargon of the mystics than to the established tenets of locke whatever therefore appeared with my name was condemned beforehand as predestined metaphysics in a dramatic poem which had been submitted by me to a gentleman of great influence in the theatrical world occurred the following passage o oh, we are querulous creatures little less than all things can suffice to make us happy 
and little more than nothing is enough to make us wretched. Ay, here now, exclaimed the critic, here come Coleridge's metaphysics, and the very same motive, that is, not that the lines were unfit for the present state of our immense theatres, but that they were metaphysics, was assigned elsewhere for the rejection of the two following passages. The first is spoken in answer to a usurper who had rested his plea on the circumstance that he had been chosen by the acclamations of the people. What people? How convened? Or if convened? Must not the magic power that charms together millions of men in council needs have power to win or wield them? Rather, oh, far rather, shout forth thy titles to yon circling mountains, and with a thousandfold reverberation make the rocks flatter thee, and the volleying air, unbribed, shout back to thee, King Emmerich, by wholesome laws to embank the sovereign power, to deepen by restraint and by prevention of lawless will, to amass and guide the flood in its majestic channel, is man's task and the true patriot's glory. In all else men safelier trust to heaven than to themselves when least themselves, even in those whirling crowds where folly is contagious, and too oft even wise men leave their better sense at home, to chide and wonder at them when returned. The second passage is in the mouth of an old and experienced courtier, betrayed by the man in whom he had most trusted. And yet Sir Alter, simple, inexperienced, could see him as he was, and often warn me. Whence learned she this? Oh, she was innocent. And to be innocent is nature's wisdom. The fledged dove knows the prowlers of the air, feared soon is seen, and flutters back to shelter, and the young steed recoils upon his haunches, the never-yet-seen adder's hiss first heard. O oh, surer than suspicion's hundred eyes is that fine sense, which to the pure in heart, by mere oppugnancy of their own goodness, reveals the approach of evil. As therefore my character as a writer could not easily be more injured by an overt act than it was already in consequence of the report, I published a work, a large portion of which was professedly metaphysical. A long delay occurred between its first enunciation and its appearance. It was reviewed, therefore, by anticipation with a malignity so avowedly and exclusively personal as is, I believe, unprecedented even in the present contempt of all common humanity that disgraces and endangers the liberty of the press. After its appearance, the author of this lampoon undertook to review it in the Edinburgh Review, and under the single condition that he should have written what he himself really thought, and have criticised the work as he would have done had its author been indifferent to him, I should have chosen that man myself, both from the vigour and the originality of his mind, and from his particular acuteness in speculative reasoning before all others. I remember Catullus's lines. Desine de quoquam quicquam bene veli mereri, aut aliquam fieri posse putare pium. Omnia sunt ingrata, nihil feci se benigne est, imo etiam taedet, taedet obesque magis. Ud mihi quem nemo gravius nec acerbius urget, quam modo qui me unum atque unicum amicum habuit but I can truly say that the grief with which I read this rhapsody of predetermined insult had the rhapsodist himself for its whole and sole object. I refer to this review at present, in consequence of information having been given me, that the innuendo of my potential infidelity, grounded on one passage of my first lay sermon, has been received and propagated with a degree of credence, of which I can safely acquit the originator of the calumny. I give the sentences as they stand in the sermon, premising only that I was speaking exclusively of miracles worked for the outward senses of men. It was only to overthrow the usurpation exercised in and through the senses that the senses were miraculously appealed to. Reason and religion are their own evidence. The natural sun is in this respect a symbol of the spiritual. Ere he is fully arisen, and while his glories are still under veil, he calls up the breeze to chase away the usurping vapours of the night season and thus converts the air itself into the minister of its own purification, not surely in proof or elucidation of the light from heaven, but to prevent its interception. Wherever, therefore, similar circumstances coexist with the same moral causes, the principles revealed and the examples recorded in the inspired writings render miracles superfluous, and if we neglect to apply truths in expectation of wonders, or under pretext of the cessation of the latter, we tempt God and merit the same reply which our Lord gave to the Pharisees, on a like occasion. In the sermon and the notes, both the historical truth and the necessity of the miracles are strongly and frequently asserted. The testimony of books of history, that is, relatively to the signs and wonders with which Christ came, is one of the strong and stately pillars of the church, but it is not the foundation. Instead, therefore, of defending myself, which I could easily effect by a series of passages, 
expressing the same opinion from the fathers and the most eminent protestant divines from the reformation to the revolution i shall merely state what my belief is concerning the true evidences of christianity one its consistency with right reason i consider as the outer court of the temple the common area within which it stands two the miracles within through which the religion was first revealed and attested i regard as the steps the vestibule and the portal of the temple three the sense the inward feeling in the soul of each believer of its exceeding desirableness the experience that he needs something joined with the strong foretokening that the redemption and the graces propounded to us in christ are what he needs this i hold to be the true foundation of the spiritual edifice with the strong a priori probability that flows in from one and three on the correspondent historical evidence of two no man can refuse or neglect to make the experiment without guilt but four it is the experience derived from a practical conformity to the conditions of the gospel it is the opening eye the dawning light the terrors and the promises of spiritual growth the blessedness of loving god as god the nascent sense of sin hated as sin and of the incapability of attaining to either without christ it is the sorrow that still rises up from beneath and the consolation that meets it from above the bosom treacheries of the principal in the warfare and the exceeding faithfulness and long-suffering of the uninteresting ally in a word it is the actual trial of the faith in christ with its accompaniments and results that must form the arched roof and the faith itself is the completing keystone in order to an efficient belief in christianity a man must have been a christian and this is the seeming argumentum in circulo incident to all spiritual truths to every subject not presentable under the forms of time and space as long as we attempt to master by the reflex acts of the understanding what we can only know by the act of becoming do the will of my father and ye shall know whether i am of god these four evidences i believe to have been and still to be for the world for the whole church all necessary all equally necessary but at present and for the majority of christians born in christian countries i believe the third and the fourth evidences to be the most operative not as superseding but as involving a glad undoubting faith in the two former credidi idioque intellexi appears to me the dictate equally of philosophy and religion even as i believe redemption to be the antecedent of sanctification and not its consequent all spiritual predicates may be construed indifferently as modes of action or as states of being thus holiness and blessedness are the same idea now seen in relation to act and now to existence the ready belief which has been yielded to the slander of my potential infidelity i attribute in part to the openness with which i have avowed my doubts whether the heavy interdict under which the name of benedict spinoza lies is merited on the whole or to the whole extent be this as it may i wish however that i could find in the books of philosophy theoretical or moral which are alone recommended to the present students of theology in our established schools a few passages as thoroughly pauline as completely accordant with the doctrines of the established church as the following sentences in the concluding page of spinoza's ethics de inde quo mens hoc amore divino seo beatitudine magis gaudet eo plus intelligent hoc est eo majorum in affectus habet potentiam et eo minus ab affectibus qui malisunt partito adque adeo ex eo quod mens hoc amore divino seo beatitudine gaudet potestatem habet libidines co ascendi et quia humana potentia ad co ascendos affectus in solo intellectu consistit ergo nemo beatitudine gaudet quia affectus co erquit sed contra potestas libidines co ascendi ex ipsa beatitudine orito with regard to the unitarians it has been shamelessly asserted that i have denied them to be christians god forbid for how should i know what the piety of the heart may be or what quantum of error in the understanding may consist with a saving faith in the intentions and actual dispositions of the whole moral being in any one individual never will god reject a soul that sincerely loves him be his speculative opinions what they may and whether in any given instance certain opinions be they unbelief or misbelief are compatible with a sincere love of god god can only know but this i have said and shall continue to say that if the doctrines the sum of which i believe to constitute the truth in christ be christianity then unitarianism is not and vice versa and that in speaking theologically and impersonally i e of silanthropism and theanthropism as schemes of belief without reference to individuals who profess either the one or the other it will be absurd to use a different language as long as it is the dictate of common sense that two opposites cannot properly be called by the same name i should feel no offence if a unitarian applied the same to me 
any more than if he were to say that two and two being four, four and four must be eight. Alabroton ton men, keneophrones alkai, exagathon ibalon, ton dao katamemphthent agan, iskun okeon, parasphalen kalon, keros elkon apiso, thumas atomos eon. This has been my object, and this alone can be my defence, and oh, that with this, my personal, as well as my literary life, might conclude. The unquenched desire, I mean, not without the consciousness of having earnestly endeavoured to kindle young minds, and to guard them against the temptations of scorners, by showing that the scheme of Christianity, as taught in the liturgy and homilies of our church, though not discoverable by human reason, is yet in accordance with it, that link follows link by necessary consequence, that religion passes out of the ken of reason, only where the eye of reason has reached its own horizon, and that faith is then but its continuation, even as the day softens away into the sweet twilight, and twilight hushed and breathless steals into the darkness. It is night, sacred night. The upraised eye views only the starry heaven, which manifests itself alone, and the outward beholding is fixed on the sparks twinkling in the awful depth, though suns of other worlds, only to preserve the soul steady and collected in its pure act of inward adoration to the great I am, and to the filial word that reaffirmeth it from eternity to eternity, whose choral echo is the universe. Theo, Mono, Doxa. End of chapter 24 End of Biographia Literaria